So our webinar is live and people are starting to come in. Um, I'll give people a few minutes uh, to join us. So as people are coming in, thank you so much for being with Board Assist today. We are we are so thrilled you're part of our first Board Assist nonprofit summit. We know everybody is extremely busy right now. Um, and we know everybody is sitting on a lot of Zoom calls. So we really, really appreciate you're making time for another Zoom call. Um, and you're already very full Zoom schedule today. Um, when we first started talking internally about doing this summit at Board Assist, we were worried, you know, well, even though we knew we we're going to have these incredibly fabulous speakers, um, would anybody have time for another Zoom call? So we've been, we've been thrilled to see um, how much interest there is in the topic, how much interest there is in board service, um, and that you're, that you're making time to be with us today. Um, I will tell you as somebody who's had a front row seat for some really um, uh, heartwarming and wonderful news about New York over the course of the pandemic. Um, as, as somebody who recruits for boards, uh, what I've seen is from the very beginning, um, even in the first few weeks of the pandemic where um, there was so much uncertainty in New York um, and we didn't know if we were gonna run out of hospital beds and we had the Javits Center and, and beds in, the, in Central Park and all of this, um, I still have people reaching out every day saying, how can I help? Uh, what can I do to, you know, hashtag be the change right now? It never ended. And then as the year went on and um, the worries that our country was facing grew from just COVID to dealing with social justice issues, just more and more people raised their hands and said, how can I help um, in, in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of all this, join a board, make a difference. So um, it, it's, it's really incredible. We live in an amazing city. Um, and I, I've been here for the whole time. <laughs> and I can tell you, um, I've seen a lot of ups and downs um, outside my window. Um, and it, it's, really, it's really incredible. Um, so as people are filing in, I, I'm going to launch uh, a poll just to um, join, join the poll as you're coming in. Um, and let's see. Let's see who's in our audience, although I know a lot about all of you and I know how committed all of you are to um, being, being part of making the world a better place. Um, while that poll is coming in, uh, I wanna take a moment to thank our incredible panelists for being with us today. Um, as you're gonna see over the next two and a half hours, we have an incredible group of nonprofit board leaders with us today. Um, we are so grateful that they've made time to share their wisdom with us today. It's, it's, you're going to learn a lot. Uh, if you have to hop and can't be with us the entire time because we are in the middle of the work day, uh, we are recording this and it will be very easy for me to send you a recording uh, after the summit. Um, we want to thank all of you attendees for making time to learn more about nonprofit board service today. Um, we know you're very busy. And so the fact that you're considering joining another board or perhaps joining your first board, uh, we really, really appreciate that. After the summit, uh, if you'd like to follow up and learn more about serving on a board, please email us at info at boardassist.org. We're very, very happy to help you find your dream board. Um, as you all know, we're a nonprofit ourselves. There is no fee for any candidate to work with us to have us match you with the board. Um, for those of you who are new to hearing about Board Assist, we are New York's leading personalized nonprofit board matching service. Uh, we find amazing people like the people who are panelists on this Zoom call, as well as the attendees um, for amazing boards. Um, over the last 20 years, we've brought over $124 million into the nonprofit community through our placements. And the number that we're really proudest of is the number 94. 94% of the people that we place on boards are serving as leaders within 12 months of being placed. So we're, we're very proud of that. Our, our placements come on and um, they're amazing people like Jonathan and Carlton who immediately assume leadership positions. Godam, who, um, um, is the board chair of a board that we placed him with right now where he's 
like been incredibly effective and makes board assist look so great. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in a board, that's what we're hoping we would be able to do for you is um, link you with a board where you could really be an agent of change. Um, some final housekeeping issues before I introduce our panelists. Uh, we are in a webinar format at this point in the pandemic. I think everybody knows how that works. Um, if you want to send any pan uh, questions to us at any point, please use the Q&A at the very bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, just put your cursor along the, the very bottom part of your screen and Q&A will pop up. Um, that's how I'm gonna see questions. We're gonna attempt to answer as many as we can, uh, both live throughout the summit, and then we're gonna have a dedicated Q&A uh, answer session at the very end from 6.15 to 6.30. Um, the chat feature has been disabled so that um, with Q&A, I can keep the questions organized and make sure I'm getting to everyone. So um, if you have questions, please go through the, the Q&A function. Uh, the questions we'll be answering today are ones that are largely supply, supplied by the panelists who are with us today, uh, as well as you in the audience today. Um, I think I've mentioned, if you're coming in late, we are recording this summit. So yeah, if you have to leave early, uh, just follow up with us tomorrow and we'll be sure to uh, uh, share the summit recording with you. Um, and with that in mind, we can see with the voting coming in, it looks like 61% of you are currently serving on a board, over half have served on a board, and um, it looks like we have uh, mainly people who typically live in New York City or the tri-state area. Um, so because we have a lot of great ground to cover and a lot of amazing panelists with us, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. Um, with us in this first panelist, uh, panel, excuse me, we have Carlton Charles. He's the vice president and treasurer of Hearst, overseeing treasury, risk management, and insurance, and is the chair of, risk, of the risk working group, which among other risks is focused on cybersecurity and data privacy. Carlton's on the board of advisors of Hearst Labs, Hearst platform for nurturing and growing early stage women-led companies. He also serves on the board of Build, which teaches entrepreneurship to youth and underserved communities, where I'm proud to say we placed him. Carlton's a member of the Executive Leadership Council and National Association of Corporate Directors, uh, where he is a governance fellow. Uh, we also have with us Kirsten Feldman, who is Morgan Stanley's former head of global retail and the investment banking division. She served on the Board of Trustees of the Environmental Defense Fund and EDF Action since 2001. Kirsten represents EDF as a member of the Green Leadership Trust, a group which works to expand the impact and leadership of people of color and indigenous people serving on U.S. environmental nonprofit boards. She's a current trustee of the Montana Land Reliance and was, and was the board chair of Steep Rock Association, a land trust based in Washington, Connecticut. Kirsten also sits in the advisory board of the Ivy School of Business at the University of Water, uh, Western Ontario and on the board of Asphalt Green. Uh, we have with us Jonathan Nee. He's the Michael T. Fries, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, professor of prof professional practice in media and technology at the Columbia Business School, where he is co-faculty director of the media and technology program. Jonathan is a longtime investment banker and still serves as a senior advisor at Evercore. He has written books on banking, media, and education, and writes the book entry column for the New York Times Deal Book. His current boards are the New Alternatives for Children, where he is a vice president, and the Citizens Committee for Children of New York, where he's placed by board assist. Um, he serves on the Emeritus Board of the National Women's Law Center after having had term li limits implemented in his capacity as chair of the Nominating and Governance Committee where he had served for 18 years. Uh, Jennifer Nason is with us. She is the global chairman of investment banking at JP Morgan. She sits on the boards of Rio Tinto, Quibi, and the American Australian Association where she was previously a chairman. She is also a member of the Partnership of New York City Innovation Council. And finally, in this first panel, we have um, Gautam Ranji with us who is a senior media executive who currently sits as an advisor, I'm sorry, serves as an advisor to media companies, boards, and investors. Most recently, he led the post-merger integration office of Viacom CBS, overseeing the integration of all businesses and functions across the combined company as an EVP in strategy planning. 
Prior to the merger of Viacom and CBS, he was the head of strategic planning and business development for the CBS Corporation. Bodem currently serves as the board chair of Breakthrough New York, where I'm pleased to say board assist placed him. Uh, so with that all in mind, uh, let's get started. Um, and I see, uh, Godem, if you can unmute, okay, terrific. Um, so um, I'm gonna start with a very easy one and I'm gonna start with Kirsten who, full disclosure, has been told she'd be called on first. Uh, a question that came up over and over from the attendees and from other panelists. It seems like such an easy question, but it, it is a very good question in my mind. Um, and I would love for everybody on the panel, because it is such an important question, for everyone to chime in on this if you're comfortable. So here's what is the best single piece of advice you can give to someone who wants to be an outstanding board member? And the corollary, what does a really bad board member look like? Thank you, Cynthia, and thank you for doing this. Um, I would say the most basic thing to be a good board member is be prepared, make every board meeting, read the and read the materials. And likewise, the worst board members are the ones that skip board meetings because they just never become part of, they, they miss too much. You know, when you have four quarterly board meetings and you missed a quarter of that, then you're by definition not a good board member. Um, I try to uh, focus on strategic issues. That's why you're there. I work hard to add value in any way I can without uh, being a high maintenance board member. I draw on my work experience, firstly. I try to use my personal network to, to, to do it. But mainly, I try to help the executive director as best I can. And sometimes it's, um, right now, when many, you know, given COVID, many uh, nonprofits are trying to rethink their business model. And so you try to help with, with that. Or sometimes it's just checking in with the ED and, and being a cheerleader. So um, I think it's really being engaged and, and being strategic and, and, uh, uh, and being there. And Kirsten, I, I know from working with boards that you are on, uh, what you said about being a support and cheerleader for the executive director is, is so true. I know that that's really valued by the boards that you sit on. Um, and it, it, is, it is something to remember that that, that, is, that is a very important thing that the executive director really does rely on the board to, um, to be on their side. Um, Jonathan, do you wanna chime in? Uh, sure. I guess what I would say is I, I don't think there is a, a, a good generic answer to that question. I, I think it is about taking a, a, a deep breath and, and looking around at the organization in terms of what its needs are, looking around at your fellow board members and seeing what it is that they bring to bear, and then being candid about yourself and what it is that you can contribute that's going to add. And that's gonna be very different based on the type of ED that you've got in terms of what their skills are, based on what the mix of, uh, of resources that the rest of the board brings to bear is. So it's, it, it's really something that requires you to, yes, you need to show up at the board meetings to figure out what the answer to this question is, but what the answer is will be very different from board to board based on what skills are, are already present there. And honestly, where I've made the biggest difference over the years were things that I just would never have predicted. I mean, the sort of random crazy things that I, I, I don't know why this just came into my head. Maybe it's because uh, Kristen uh, gave me a flashback to my Morgan Stanley days. But... I mean, the first, the first major contribution I made on a board I was on, where I felt, wow, you know, that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for me, was something I would never have thought of, which was, uh, it was, I, at the time, I was at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we were uh, the unhappy owners of Marvel <laughs> Entertainment <laughs> at the time, uh, and we weren't on purpose. It was because we owned the debt, and they went bankrupt, so we became the owners of the equity. Um, <laughs> 
But New Alternatives for Children uh, had has a really important annual event, which is a party for the, the families and the children. And uh, I got the Marvel characters to show up uh, at it. And it's not something I would ever have thought to try to do or think of. But you know, you, you don't know what resources you have that may make a real difference. And it, if you looked at the looks on the face of those families, when uh, the X-Men showed up, you will know that that actually was a bigger contribution than anything else I could have done. That, that's such a great example. And, and you know, at Bordesis, we survey every year to see uh, what sort of contributions our placements are making. And we always hear these stories that are so incredible of how people's board service has morphed in, in ways that they never anticipated and how satisfying that can be. Um, Carlton, do you want to um, try it and to respond to this question about a good and bad board member, what they look like? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think um, for me, getting involved um, from kind of day one has been a part of what I try to do. And um, I think we all have uh, some means of contributing to that board that we're on. Um, like you said, sometimes it's just simply giving access to your network. Um, um, and so that's kind of what I've tried to do. I've brought people into the organization who could potentially be board members, people who could kind of write a check if we're fundraising, um, people who um, could some, attend some of the events. Um, our board is really focused on entrepreneurship education. So we have like demo days um, for the kids. And, uh, you know, I've asked some of my friends to attend some of the demo days to be judges. I mean, things like that, simple things that really don't require a lot of work, but, you know, are invaluable to the kids who are being served by that board. So um, I think we all have a contribution that we can make. It's just a matter of kind of thinking about um, what you do and, and your network and finding out a way that you can be add some value. And that's what I've tried to do. So um, you drive home a really great point that being a board member is um, often about doing things like very little things and then very strategic things like it might be a new strategic plan, but it, it's also sometimes just doing the little things to support the organization, um, which can be so incredibly impactful. Jennifer, you've been a board chair. What, what would you add to this? Yeah, so, uh, and again, uh, thank you, Cynthia, for having me on this panel. I, um, I think it's really important to understand what the best way uh, is for you to contribute to an organization. I've encountered um, in my uh, board work for nonprofits is, is some people sometimes equate being passionate about an organization or an effort with, therefore, I must be on the board. I think the, the board is one way to do good and to serve an organization. It's certainly not the only way. So to be a good board member, as Kirsten said, you've really got to be willing to do the work and there's often a lot of work. You've really got to understand what governance is all about and that you are well placed to serve um, in that capacity and that you do genuinely have an interest or a passion for the work that's being done. It is really hard to be a good board member if there really isn't that personal hook uh, uh, for you. And Jennifer, for, for you as someone who's been a board chair, uh, do you have experience with board members that were less than optimal uh, that needed to go? And what, what sort of behavior was a less than optimal behavior that said to you, this, this person really should not be on our team anymore? Yeah, so I, when I became chair of the American Australian Association, I asked every board member to resign so that we could reconstitute the board. And, um, and they actually did resign, which was a very good uh, first step. And then we, we just reconstituted the board with a handful from the original membership and added others. And again, there was just confusion as to the role, confusion as to sort of the purpose. Um, a lot of people who really just didn't have the skill or qualification to be a board member and I, I think just because it's a non-profit doesn't mean you don't take governance very seriously and and so forth so um, uh, I think it's very easy for boards uh, to drift to get big to get unwieldy and for everybody to be on a board for a very different reason and that can make certainly makes being chairman 
uh, and, and president of an organisation extraordinarily uh, difficult. So sort of mandate creep or confusion can be a big problem. That was certainly what I encountered coming in as chair. So we really needed to take the extreme step, uh, step of, a, of a reboot. But it was the best thing we ever did for the organisation and it has flourished because of the great board that we have, uh, that we have now. So um, that, that's so interesting that you did that because um, you, you, you saved a fortune in board consulting fees. Um, <laughs> when you hire a board consultant, that is the first piece of advice they typically give is get your entire board to resign, draft up an agreement of this is what a good board member looks like, um, and then have everybody re-sign up with those new rules and that new contract in place. So. Um, I never hold myself out as a board consultant because there's a lot of great people that do that. Um, but that is, uh, but I deal with a lot of board consultants who come to us and say, we got rid of everybody and nobody signed back up again. <laughs> that, that can be what happens, Jennifer. <laughs> yeah. Well, there were definitely volunteers to not rejoin because we did set those bars. You've got to meet the following criteria. And some of them, quite frankly, ran for the hills in those circumstances, which told you something about how the board was functioning before. So I am, um, I should have had that as one of our questions ahead of time. I'm so glad you brought it up on your own because that is such a great board best practice. Um, and it's just such an easy way. People are, you know, very uncomfortable sometimes when you've had somebody who's been with your organization a long time and maybe the law of diminishing returns has set in and they are not contributing in the way that they were 20 years ago. Um, and did I just re misuse that, Jonathan? You were kind of rolling your eyes. <laughs> A uh, long time since I was in business school. Uh, but um, anyway, the, the point being that, um, uh, you know, sometimes you need to get rid of those people that have been there for a long time who were wonderful at one point, and it's uncomfortable because they've been a great donor of time, talent, and treasure for a long time. And so doing exactly what Jennifer did is brilliant. Uh, take away one thing from this summit, take that away. That's such a great way to just clean house um, without having to single anybody out and just get that total new reboot. It's so effective and it really energizes everyone. Kirsten, did you have something you wanted well, to add I there? I just want to reiterate something that Jennifer just said that, the, that to go on a board, you really have to have a fundamental passion for the mission. And I found that the board members that aren't, don't end up being good, just don't have, didn't have that. So that's what leads to them not being as engaged as they should be, missing board meetings and so on. And if you, if you don't have it, you're probably not going to get it going in. So it's, it's, it's really um, making, having the, the, the mission has to resonate. Um, let's try and get Godem in here. I was actually just about to say what Kristen just Sorry. said. I'm, I'm a firm <laughs> believer that, uh, you know, good board membership starts with a foundation of passion for the mission, right? If they're not, if they're not uh, engaged in the outcomes of the organization and passionate about those outcomes, they're not over time going to be able to contribute their expertise in a meaningful way. Um, you know, and going back to um, uh, what Jennifer was saying two minutes ago um, about people not understanding uh, no matter how much passion you have for the organization. So I completely agree with um, Godem and Kirsten, you have to have that passion. Um, and then you also have to understand that it's different serving on the board than being a volunteer. Uh, we see that at Board Assist all the time. Somebody will come uh, to us and they're you know, very, very interested in charter schools, but they don't seem to understand that they're not going to be tutoring the children or working with the children in any way. They're serving at the board level. And Carlton is actually in a very unique situation where his board, they get to have a lot of contact with the actual children that they're serving, but that's unusual. And um, it's hard for people to understand that sometimes is it, you don't, you're, you're functioning at a board level and not down at the staff level where you're interacting with the people that you're serving. So that can be a surprise for some people. Um, think, so what, Jonathan? I was just gonna say, uh, I think there are, there are two uh, mistakes people make. Uh, and all of them go back to the point Jennifer made, which is that corporate governance is the same and as important, if not more important, with nonprofits than for profits. Uh, and the two mistakes people make are uh, if they are passionate, it, it doesn't mean that the 
best way to show that passion is through being on the board because the board plays a very particular role. And if that passion is about volunteering, working with the, the people uh, uh, who are, are getting served rather than dealing with governance issues, it's probably not the right role. The flip side of that is, uh, just like you see in for-profit boards sometimes, sometimes people get confused between the boundaries between a board member and somebody running the organization. Uh, and frankly, uh, many of the people you, you see uh, here are, are quite distinguished folks who uh, are, could run and do run much bigger and more important organizations. So they think, well, I should be running this, but that is not the role of a board member uh, unless something has gone quite wrong. And if I was going to pick a, a second criteria you should uh, use other than having passion, uh, uh, go on the board of organizations where you have great respect for the ED because if the person who's running it isn't getting it done, being a board member is as miserable on nonprofit as it is being a board member of a for-profit or if it's not worse. So in a normal situation where the person knows what they're doing, your job is to provide support and, uh, and leadership and, um, and, and some direction. You're not, uh, you're not second guessing, you're not a backseat driver, you're a board member. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I was just gonna uh, second that really because um, on, on the board of BUILD, um, Shamika Alphonse is a really great leader of, uh, of that board and um, when I, um, Cynthia knows this, when I was looking around for boards to get, get on, I actually interviewed uh, the EDs and some of the folks on the boards of a couple of different boards. And uh, I really was impressed by Shamika and that's one of the reasons why I joined that board. So. Um, you, you really have to believe in the ED and, and believe that that person is the right person uh, and just really support the ED. So, um, Jonathan, you touched on something and I realized before we lose you, I wanted to make sure I asked this question to you, but then I also have some very specific questions that um, for this panel before, I, the time is going by very quickly. I realized I kind of needed like 10 hours of your time, but, but Jonathan, you, you brought up um, a question that uh, somebody had asked before the, we met today, um, and that is about the difference between being on a corporate and a nonprofit board. Um, and you, 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 you mentioned two, two separate things just in passing. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Honestly, I don't think it's radically different. <laughs> uh, I think uh, who ultimately uh, you, you're not uh, pursuing the objectives of shareholders. So that's different because it's a nonprofit. So it's your, the ultimate uh, people whose interests are um, uh, your, your fiduciary for is different. But broadly, um, I, I think it's actually quite, uh, quite similar. And you should, and taking governance uh, seriously and uh, being focused on uh, how you can contribute to support the, uh, the, the leadership of the organization in terms of actually delivering to the constituents that whoever that organization is serving, that's really ultimately your, uh, the, the equivalent of your shareholders, I think. Uh, so other than that, I think actually there's fewer differences than people imagine. I don't know if I that. Does anyone disagree with that? No, I, I, I agree. And little things like I, I know when, when I became chair of the AAA, we, we had to institute things like papers need to be distributed ahead of time and ideally a week ahead of time. So you can actually read them and contribute and not to show up at board meetings and people are throwing pages at you. You know, the audit committee needed to be you mean the committees needed were serious undertakings and needed to um, uh, deliver results and maybe again be be reconfigured. So I, I've actually that was probably one of the biggest surprises to me in the nonprofit world is why would you ex expect things to be somehow second rate relative to a corporate board? Not at not at all. So I think the parallels are are pretty clear and you should expect the equal rigor and 
and um, and discipline. And again, the the people who should be on these nonprofit boards should be people who sort of have that mindset. I think. Although, having said that, you know, on a nonprofit board, you are often asked to volunteer in certain respects, and that would be different than a, a for-profit board. And so, I think it's the 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 volunteer role that can then lead into blurring of the lines that you mentioned earlier. But um, uh, I think nonprofits do use board members to volunteer when they are missing an expertise, uh, whether it's transaction expertise or financial expertise or, or fundraising development. And that, that, that's the main difference I see. So Kirsten, um, we're, at, we're gonna talk at length in, in the next panel about that board staff line because it is such a big issue and it does lead to um, when there is trouble on the board, it's almost always an issue of that board staff line being blurry. But because I have so many uh, current and former board chairs like you on this particular part of the panel, I, I did wanna talk also because I promised um, um, Gautam that we would talk about board chair evaluation. That was his question <laughs> as a board chair. I want to honor my word. Um, um, Gautam wanted to talk about uh, what you've seen on your boards, uh, ways that have been effective for evaluating the executive director, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the board chair. Um, so because we have, as I said, so many terrific former and current board chairs, what are things that you, and Kirsten, since you're on my screen right now as the active speaker, we'll have you go first. Um, what have you seen um, as particularly effective tools um, and even and ineffective tools uh, for the board to manage, uh, to evaluate the board chair? Um, I have a dog barking in the background. So <laughs> I, you may want to, others may want to answer that. I don't know that I've seen a great model for evaluating the board chair, to be honest. Kirsten, I, I will tell you, I was so happy that Gautam asked this question because I never hear of boards doing this. Um, so it wouldn't be unique to your board. Uh, I, I literally never hear of boards doing a formal ad, uh, annual um, board review of the board chair. So uh, I'd love if any of you have been on a board um, who where they have evaluated the board chair on a regular basis, uh, we'd love to hear anything that's worked and not worked. Yeah, and I'll just jump in. I mean, I think the genesis of the question for me was, look, I'm a first time board chair. Um, I've served as the head of the finance committee, but I'm within the tenure of the uh, board, I'm relatively new. And I just, you know, I'm doing lots with all different members of the board. And one day I was just like, well, how do I know I'm doing a good job? I mean, we have a rigorous process around evaluating the ED with goals and people opine, and there's a real process for determining performance. but that doesn't, I think, bubble up to the board chair, which is in many ways, a, you know, a person's, a role that touches lots of different parts of the organization. So I was just struggling with how do I get feedback from people in a more structured manner and curious if other boards did anything for their board chair. Uh, th there is this uh, service that I recommend uh, called Board Source which has, uh, which you want to sign up for, it's got a bunch of best practices around a number of things, including this. Uh, okay. I, I became aware of it just because I became the, the chair of the, nom uh, the nominating governance committee on, um, uh, on an organization. But what I would say is like everything, uh, and, uh, and maybe this is true, um, Maybe this is also this is a difference with uh, nonprofit boards. Uh, I think the variance uh, of the role that the board is playing in the success of the organization is quite varies quite widely. So, I, I you know the number of board members on a whole range of of criteria. I think there's a, a much broader range of, um, of uh, permutations you see in nonprofits than you see in for-profits, probably because ISS has certain, certain uh, bar, uh, you know, guardrails that people sort of stay within, whereas within nonprofits, it's all over the place. So it's, uh, I find board source quite useful as kind of uh, some potential guardrails, but 
it's, uh, I think if you get too lawyerly about, well, it's uh, best practices to have, um, is to have uh, term limits and best practices, two terms of three years, you know, it really depends on the, on the organization and the situation. Um, I, but, but with respect to review, not just of the chair, but review of the committees, review of board members in general, there, there's a, there are a bunch of processes which, again, you can get way too formalistic. If you do every best practice, you will spend all your time doing practices rather than helping the organization. Uh, it, it's still a useful thing to look at and then consider in your situation whether it really makes sense or not. Yeah, I would say that I would say that it's an important role of a board chair to every year be checking in with your board members, you know, on how is their board service going, how is their committee going, and by doing that, also get solicit feedback on how they see you doing. And so um, I think it's depending on how big the board is, it's a hard discipline to make sure you do. But but I sort of have taken you know, the month of January or February to, to do check-in calls and other boards I've been on do that as well. So it may not be formal, but it's really important to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with your board members. Jennifer, how about you as a former board chair, um, thoughts on evaluating the board chair? Yeah, well, I'm no longer chair, so I, I kind of missed the report card. So that's <laughs> <laughs> maybe good. Um, I found during my tenure, um, uh, the, the feedback I got, and I guess I reviewed, I viewed this as perhaps an, in, an informal uh, sort of evaluation of my own performance, was from some key traditional supporters of the organisation. So we, we, we had some key sort of benefactors and people who'd just been associated with the organisation financially or whatever for a long time. And they, they were the people I went to to say, how do you think I'm doing? And some of them just volunteered feedback during my tenure. So um, it's actually an excellent question. And I'm going to think about this now because we're not really doing this um, at, at the American Australian Association. But, but it happened for me sort of somewhat informally. But I got feedback. People... People were not shy about <laughs> telling me what they thought, and, and I welcomed that feedback and sorted out my myself. But but it is an excellent question. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about how we evaluate our president who runs the organisation versus um, even board member feedback or chairman feedback. It, it's an excellent point. I, I love that you got feedback um, from outside the organisation because we were going to also in later panels talk about feedback both internally, but also obviously externally with donors and the constituents you serve is so important. Um, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I can see Justin Avalo on my screen, who is a current board chair. And even though it's not his panel yet, I see him nodding his head about all this. So I know he wants to chime in on this board chair evaluation question. Justin, do you want to come off mute for a minute? No, I absolutely. This is the only question that I've heard so far that I don't want to chime in on at all. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Every board I know talks about this. I don't know a single board uh, that actually does do an evaluation formally, um, at least none of the ones I've been involved with of the board chair. One interesting thing I'll just note in passing before I go back on mute is that when we evaluate our executive director or head of school or president, it is often the case that board members take advantage of that evaluation to comment about the board chair. Um, so it's clear that they, they, in many cases, have things that they want to say and like water seeking its own level, sometimes it leaks into those um, adjacent evaluative processes. Um, sorry for cheating about that, Justin, but I, I did see you vigorously nodding your head, so I, I had to get you in there. Um, do any of you uh, serve on boards where there is an annual or regular um, self-evaluation done by the board members, and has that been effective or ineffective? So it sounds like none of you guys are on boards that do that because that, that is that's a standard uh, practice that a lot of 
towards uh, in as Jonathan was saying, there are all these fabulous best practices that you can read about and they can drive you crazy. Um, Jonathan, Justin, myself, we are all recovering lawyers and we will never be fully recovered. Um, I think Jonathan is a recovering lawyer, maybe not. Um, yes. And um, uh, yes, you can get so bogged down into all these things that you're supposed to be doing, which really may not even be particularly effective. So, um, or, or, or they may be, but it, it does seem a practice that's not that common. Christian, it looks like you had something to add. Well, I was going to say that I been on a board where you filled out a survey about your your service, but I just don't think it replicates having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. In my experience, that the best boards, you actually speak to a person and you'll learn a lot more about how it's really going. Kirsten, that's an incredible thing that you're doing. I literally have never heard of a board chair checking in with each board member every year. Um, that, well, that's sometimes astonishing. Sometimes it's the nominating committee will divide up the, the board. If, there, if it's a 40 person board, you know, that's difficult. So the nominating committee may take 10 people each and then you'll reconvene and, and have a conversation. But whether when, it's you or- when it's not annual, Cynthia, the other, the other less good alternative, the sort of least, the sort of less robust version of what Kirsten's describing is um, doing it at the end of a term before, before a board member takes on a second term. That's a point where the nominating committee often sits down with a board member and says, would you like to be considered for a second term? Let's talk about how you think the first term went, what you did well, what you didn't do well, what we all did well and didn't do well. But th this is this is such an important point to bring up with best practices, this concept of board members at some point in their life cycle on the board or as they're cycling off, talking about how their board experience was, both in terms of what they were able to contribute um, and what they wanted to contribute that they felt they weren't able to contribute because of some um, this, uh, dysfunction at the board level that didn't allow them um, to contribute in the way they wanted to. You know, going back to what Kirsten said 40 minutes ago, um, so much of it is about showing up. Um, at Board Assist, a lot of people come to us and say, I want another board. I was on this other board and it was a horrible experience. Can you find me another board? And, you know, of course, then we asked what was so bad about the other board? Well, you know, I, I had all these great ideas and nobody ever wanted to listen to all the great ideas I had. <laughs> that, that's a very common one. Um, and you know, oftentimes they're leaving a board that we know. And when we go back and we ask that other board, hey, what happened with Justin? Why was he you know, such a dud on your board? Not that anybody would ever say that about Justin. Uh, <clears throat> what you'll hear is what Kirsten said 40 minutes ago, which is, well, he never showed up. Um, he missed like you know, six board meetings in a row. And then he showed up at the seventh board meeting and he had all these ideas and he didn't understand why nobody wanted to listen to him. Well, nobody wanted to listen to him because he wasn't part of the team. Uh, have to be part of the team to get things done. Um, I do want to mention, um, uh, I don't know what that sounded, sorry. Um, I, I fear it might be coming from my computer. Um, Jonathan mentioned board source for everybody who is not familiar, anyone who's not familiar with them. It's a fabulous website, boardassist. I'm sorry, boardsource.org. They are a nonprofit. Um, they're out of DC. They are the leading governance support nonprofit um, in the country. They publish a million articles on any topic that you could ever be interested in. Uh, their model keeps changing, so I'm not exactly sure where it is right now um, in terms of whether all the content is free, a certain subset of it is free. There is, at a certain point, you have to pay to get access to some of their information, but there is a lot of information that's there that's free, and it's very, very helpful, good information. So. Um, that's great. I, I am, I'm looking at the clock and realizing I, I'm, I'm losing this first panel in a few minutes. So before I do that, there were a thousand more questions I had for you. Um, do you have parting words of advice before you cycle off and then maybe hopefully rejoin us at 615? Anything really important that you wanted us to know um, about being a great board member and board best practices? Maybe we can start with you, Jonathan. Uh, I think uh, it feels like a, a good holistic conversation is completed and anything I would add would just ruin the perfection of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, Carlton, you're laughing, so you're up next. <laughs> oh, sure. 
No, I think uh, I just would be restating all the things that we said before, which is that you do have to show up, make sure you show up to the to the meetings. You know, I, I have lots of conversations with the ED about, you know, what would be helpful to her in terms of things that I can do, uh, resources that she needs that I can provide. Um, I've had the ED over to my house uh, for events and, and gotten to know her on a personal level. I think, you know, if you believe it's the right person in that role, you should support that person. Um, obviously, sometimes there's a, a reason to remove an ED because uh, they're not doing a really good job. But if you, if you believe that they're the right person, uh, do whatever you can to support them. You know, I, I, guess, I, I guess I will, uh, that, that, that did uh, trigger something, which is uh, to the earlier question of what are the differences in, as all of us who deal with real, bo real for-profit boards know, a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about lawyers uh, and worrying about, you know, have I checked every box as opposed to am I focusing on achieving the objective of this organization uh, and optimizing it? And, you know, in a nonprofit, that really is, you've got to keep your eye on the prize uh, and the prize is whatever that objective of that organization that inspired you to be a member, never forget that that is what it is about. Be creative in terms of how you organize the board, in terms of what you're doing and what you're contributing. Don't fall in love with some best practice, fall in love with the objective of the organization and do whatever you can to achieve it. Uh, and it'll be incredibly fulfilling. I'm so glad you said that because I, I could not agree with you more. Um, and the boards that we see that are struggling are ones that lose sight of that. Um, so, um, Jennifer, what would you like to add before we lose you? Oh, you're, you're on mute. That is like the new Can You Hear Me Now slogan is uh, <laughs> you're on mute. Um, I was just going to add that we, we've talked a lot about joining a board for the right reason and you really need to have, there has to be a hook for you or no amount of skill will make you a good board member uh, without that. But I would say one of the biggest surprises for me in nonprofit board work, uh, apart from being passionate about some of these causes, is, is I experienced quite meaningful professional growth out of, certainly out of being a chair. I learned things about myself. I developed other skills. I flexed muscles I hadn't flexed before. So I just got a lot out of it um, uh, professionally, uh, in addition to sort of the network of contacts and so forth. So I think you need to join for the right reasons, but I think it's okay to get something out of it in that way. It's sort of the, the perfect um, circle of, uh, of things here. If it happens the right way, it's really a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Jennifer, uh, we at Board Assist, thank you very much for saying that, because uh, we have a couple hundred board seats that we need to fill, so uh, I really appreciate that. She was uh, clearly an audience plan. <laughs> thank you for that. Go to do, um, uh, I'm sorry, Gautam, do you, would, uh, what would you add to that be, before we lose you to the next panel? Yeah, no, I, I really just would echo some of what Jennifer said, that since becoming the chair of the board, obviously I've felt you know tremendously engaged and and passionate about breakthrough as a board member but being the board chair has really enabled me to you know learn a lot about our different board members learn a lot about processes governance and you know it's almost uh, it's a totally different type of experience um, it's not for everybody I will say um, but I think that if you are willing to make that step to being the chair of the board, it can be a tremendously rewarding experience. So, Gautam, I, I'm actually glad you, you touched on that because I had that as a question, but we're having such a robust discussion. We're not getting to go through nearly all the questions I had. You said being a board chair is not for everyone, and that was a question I did want to ask specifically of one of our current board chairs. Who is it not for? You know, what is the words of warning you would have? This is this is not for you being a board chair. You know, I'll, I'll start. I mean, I think, look, um, a lot of people don't have, personally, first, they don't have the time commitment to be the board chair. I think, um, you know, the board chair just gets pulled in a lot of different directions and involved in a lot of things. Whereas if you're a regular board member, you can, you know, do your uh, board meeting attendees, you can serve on a committee. So there's a more 
I'd say predictable commitment of time and range of issues you deal with, but the board chair really, uh, I think, sees everything and so has to be prepared to be able to deal with everything. And I think the board chair, like a lot of things, it's a people management role, right? You're managing your board members, um, you're managing a relationship with an ED, you're managing relationships with outside uh, supporters of the organization. So it's a more outward facing role. And so I'm not sure that everybody wants that um, from their volunteer experience. They may want that in their professional role, but not necessarily always in their uh, you know, leisure activity or their philanthropic activities. Yeah, and that's, that's such a great point. Um, I want to thank all our uh, first round panelists enormously. Perhaps we will see some of them back at 615 for Q&A. Um, if they can mute now, and I'm going to introduce you to our second round of panelists. I can't thank the first round enough for all that, kicking us off on a, a great note. So um, in our second round of panelists, um, we have with us Justin Ablo. Um, and he has been an investment banker at Houlihan Loki for almost 20 years. He sits on that firm's management committee and is a senior member of the financial sponsors group. He has an enduring interest in both history and in education and has been involved in a number of philanthropies and civic organizations with connections to those themes. He currently serves as president of the board of the Buckley School, an independent K through nine day school in New York, and as treasurer, of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Um, we have with us Anish Batlaw. Um, and uh, okay, uh, if you are a panelist in this round, if you can unmute, that would be great. Um, Anish is an operating partner at General Atlantic and leads the firm's human capital efforts in support of its global portfolio companies. Prior to joining General Atlantic, Anish worked at TPG Capital as an operating partner and head of human capital for Asia and worked with Novartis in various leadership positions, including VP and head of HR for pharmaceuticals, US and Europe, and as head of corporate talent management. He also worked at Microsoft as general manager of HR in Redmond, Washington. Um, Anisha served on the boards of Alita Holdings, Avon Products, um, HCP Global Holdings Limited, and TPG Wholesale Private Limited. Um, we have with us Jose, Gonza Jose Ramon Gonzalez. He's executive vice president and general counsel for CNA Insurance. Jose began his career practicing law as a corporate associate at Wild Gotchel and Mangus. He later joined AIG, eventually becoming deputy general counsel, then, general count then became general counsel and corporate secretary of Taurus, a Bermuda-based startup commercial insurance organization. Jose is also the former chief legal officer of QBE North America he currently serves as chairman of the board of Latino Justice PR LDEF and on the boards of the Mass Museum of Art in Miami and the Spain U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He also serves on the Senior Leadership Council of the New York chapter of ALPFA, the Association of Latino Professionals for America. Uh, we have with us Mindy Posoff, who is a managing director and member of Golden Seeds an investment group whose network is dedicated to investing in early stage companies with gender diverse management teams. She serves as an independent trustee of the Harris Associates Investment Trust for the Oakmark family of mutual funds. She also serves on several nonprofit boards, including the Philadelphia Foundation, Ben Franklin Technology Partners, Southeastern Pennsylvania, and the Community College of Philadelphia. She's the vice chair emeritus for 100 Women in Finance, where she was one of the founding board members. We have with us President Jennifer Robb. Um, uh, Jennifer served on the board of directors of CompuWare Corporation, is currently a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She serves on the steering committee of the Association for a Better New York, advisory committee for Women NYC, and sits on the boards of directors of Expanded, United Way New York, and One to World Foundation, and was a member of the 2004 to 2005 New York City Charter Revision Commission. Jennifer began her career as a litigator at Cravath, Swain and & Moore and Paul Weiss, after which she was appointed chairman of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. And finally, in this panel, we have with us Jeff Peake. Um, Jeff is the executive vice chairman of global corporate and investment banking at B of A Securities. He is the former CEO and board chair of the CIT Group. He currently sits on the boards of American Associates of the National Theater, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 
and New York City Ballet. He is a former head, he is a former board member of the Bentheim Center for Finance at Princeton University, the Brearley School, Freddie Mac, Strategic Value Partners Advisory Board, Teachers College, and the Travelers Companies. Um, as you can see, we have a terrific second panel for you. Um, so because I'm seeing that uh, we're not going to get to nearly as many questions as I had originally hoped, which is a great problem because we're having a robust discussion, um, let's, let's start with the question that's on everyone's mind right now and really, I think, uh, sums up the board experience and best practices per, per, uh, perfectly, and that is what unique challenges has COVID-19 brought to your organization and how have you addressed them? And I'd love to start with Jeff because he sits on the board of a lot of organizations that very much depend on people showing up. Um, so, um, you know, the arts community has been hard, hit harder than just about anybody in the nonprofit community. I would love to hear um, if Jeff is comfortable discussing uh, how the boards he sits on have responded to COVID. Sure, Cynthia, I'll, I'll start off. Um, you know, three of the organizations um, that uh, uh, that I'm affiliated are really are the performing arts, and whether it's the ballet, national theater, and 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 the Met, um, and so um, all three of those. Uh, uh, the first issue is really just revenue generation, and um, you know the Met has now started. Uh, it's been open for about four weeks. Uh, big step in reopening New York City. Um, but we're limited to 25% of our average daily population, which um, pre-COVID was about 56,000. So we really can do about 14,000 uh, a day. So that obviously uh, has a big impact on revenue. Um, and um, so that's, uh, that's a big issue there. Um, and I think the other thing that maybe um, is useful for a lot of the not-for-profits um, that are uh, in the pandemic is, uh, you know, we're spending quite a bit of time working on a five-year plan because particularly for, for the Met, um, where the Chinese were our largest international group, you know, we don't think this is coming back in, uh, you know, in 12 months. So we're trying to take a longer, longer term look at that. But they are, they are open. Um, the ballet, I would say, um, best case would be that they'll start dancing next spring um, after there's a vaccine and people are comfortable sitting next to people they don't know. Um, and the National Theater a little bit is the, uh, the same way. Um, the Lehman Trilogy was a, uh, uh, a huge hit in New York and then in London. They came back here and had nine performances before they closed the theaters. Um, and I say, I, I think all of these um, institutions are working very hard on digital outreach. You know, uh, for, uh, for the Met, um, we have close to 20 million people come in every month to visit our uh, timeline of art. Um, and for the ballet and the National Theater, they are uh, trying to bring back, uh, you know, classic ballets and classic theater um, through, uh, through digital uh, type of thing. So, so I'll, I'll stop there, but it's clearly um, uh, uh, really been very uh, serious for all of those institutions and the ones that thankfully the Met and the ballet uh, have outsized endowments for, uh, for their size. I, I think, I think that the, that the pivotal concept to, to get in is to get in this is, is the endowment and any crisis in a moment and we don't know how long this moment will last, but it's a crisis in, in this moment, uh, stresses the dialogue between the present and both the past and the future, um, and creates interesting intergenerational issues in, in the form of how one is to most appropriately deploy an endowment um, against the current issue. And every board that, that I'm on or know of has at least had that conversation in this context if they have an endowment. And I know board chairs at other organizations who have said to their executive directors or, or their heads, you know, get me a list of the low hanging fruit in terms of costs 
And my own response, frankly, has been, you know, uh, the low hanging fruit is the endowment. It's for a rainy day. It's raining now, right? I know other institutions have taken different views. That's been, that's been my view. I, Justin, just to, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, at the ballet, um, we, we want to take care of the dancers um, uh, in the near term, probably for the next year. But we also think we have a fiduciary responsibility not to run down the endowment, um, you know, for, for, for future seasons. So I, I think you're right on. Jeff, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, on the three arts boards on which you sit, have you seen any individual board members with, you don't have to say which board or which board member, have, have done anything that's been particularly um, effective or impactful to help with the um, COVID response? Well, I think both of, um, uh, both of the ballet and the Met, there's been a tremendous outpouring by the boards for uh, emergency relief funds uh, over and above the endowment. So they've been particularly effective at fundraising during this moment. They have, and everybody, just, just as Justin said, it's, it's raining now, so this is a time uh, to, uh, to try and, uh, uh, I, think, I think everybody has to reevaluate their priorities and some of the fringe organizations that yeah, you, know, you uh, aligned with somewhat, but you weren't personally involved, you're, you're probably going to try and focus your resources more on the ones where you're engaged and uh, you, know, you really love the mission. I think that's, I would pick that up, Cynthia, too. I think that this, there is a real outpouring of philanthropy. And because in a way there's no galas and there's no events, there is a sense that people still need to give and, and to contribute and to support. Um, and, you know, we've had a, as an institution, we had to move 3,000 classes online in a week. Most of, so many of our students lost jobs. They're that marginal, you know, part-time work and their parents, their families lost jobs. And then we had to reopen recently. So we've reopened 10% of classes online. We've reopened our dorms. So there's just, so much pivoting going on. But I have felt, and someone mentioned digital connections of institutions with their donors. And I think that's for us one of the biggest challenges. You've lost that human connection. So for us to bring our donors with a scholarship recipient, the heart just opens, the pocketbook opens. You can't do that as much. And in some ways I've asked everyone, always look for a silver lining. And some ways a silver lining has been amazing. And for example, we do much more smaller groups with, with leaders, with students. And I, all of you will now get an invitation to talk to 100 students. And Cynthia knows I will ask you. But you'll find that half an hour to do a Zoom with 25 students where you might not have been able to do it the other way. So the engagement for us is one of the biggest problems to keep the heart open and the wallets open. And having to find a way to do it digitally is a is a way to approach the challenge of COVID. And, and I was Jennifer read my mind. I was just about to call on her to ask as somebody who's who's um, <clears throat> running a school, running a college, how COVID was impacting her. Mindy, I know you're on the board of a college as well. Um, what's what did, what's going on with that in COVID? So, so I wanted to say two things. Um, I'm, also on a co I'm also on a community college, a community foundation board. And um, this, I know in your last panel, you talked about, you know, how do you get good members and leadership? And obviously, this is the test of it. And so um, as COVID hit, all organizations, funding organizations came together through the Philadelphia Foundation and we set up a fund and hearts and minds were open. There were no uh, boundaries of who cared about what. Um, there was a generous su uh, support of a creating a COVID fund for all institutions um, in, in the city and surrounding neighborhoods. And I also, I think, I think it was Justin that's, or maybe it was Jeff, that this was the moment that we were able to connect intergenerationally to a different philanthropist to that generation that you keep wondering when they're going to step in and so we were able to those conversations that we've had over the last five years really reach out and it and it was really um it was really rewarding on the community college side um the crisis just brought everybody together um we get funding from the city from the state 
we get funding from donors. Um, the first and foremost on everybody's mind is what tools and what resources could we get to the students? And, um, you know, Comcast uh, opens up broadband in a variety of uh, places across the country. Um, it was, you know, we had donations of laptops and, and, and teachers and students were in touch more than I think even if they were walking in the room and that that is actually been consistent um, even up until today and we remain virtual and will remain virtual for um, probably through spring of next year. Jose, I'd love to get you into the conversation on your many, many boards. Um, what's been the COVID challenges and uh, what have been the COVID challenges and how have at the board level you've been able to respond? So, uh, so I'll touch on, on, on the main board that I'm on the, the chair of, which is Latino Justice, which used to be called the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. It was founded almost 50 years ago in New York, obviously to address issues of the Puerto Rican community in New York City. And, um, you know, in, in many ways, once when COVID hit, the first thing we did was have a board meeting you know, an informal, it was an official board meeting, just a, a meeting of, of the executive committee, just to really figure out what was going on. People were getting very nervous about our funding. And, and for us, luckily, this has been not a bad, you know, for, from a funding perspective, we've been okay. We raise, most of our funds come from foundations and our foundation partners have really stood up for us um, all along. And so that's been really helpful. Um, another piece of our funding comes from law firms and um, we've gotten some remark, you know, some, some people have stood up there as well and have made further donations. Um, we were part of the Mackenzie Scott, one, one point something billion dollars that was given out by Mackenzie Scott a few months ago. So that helped, it was money we did not uh, expect to receive. <laughs> um, we, also, we were also sitting on a few years of budget from a, from a property that we sold a few years ago. So we had the endowment and, and you know, in a certain way, you know, waiting in the back, but we hadn't, we didn't really need to touch it. Um, and like I said, we've, we've really, our foundation partners have uh, stood up. Some foundations, and I won't mention any names, have, have started to borrow uh, money so that they can start giving to their organizations. Clearly, as a civil rights organization um, focused on the Latino community, so we're focused on labor rights, voting rights, immigration rights, the last four years have been exceedingly challenging. Um, our community is at the forefront as essential workers, and so there again, there's been another challenge. And so I think a lot of people have recognized you know, our place, and we've been lucky from that perspective. The other, the other piece I will sort of roll into that is the Black Lives Matter movement. So um, again, we are fighting on the same issues as uh, Black Lives Matter. And so that again has caused us to get additional funding from, um, you know, $10,000, $100,000 funds from various organizations that are looking to invest in, in, in social justice. Um, my big question mark is our gala, which is virtual, and it's a month from now, and we're in the middle of, of trying to see if we're going to get anywhere near um, our goal. Um, but it's not a huge part of our funding, so it's less less pressure for us. And your costs are down on the gala. That's good news. <laughs> oh my God, massively! But you know, <laughs> gay setting up some of those virtual galas could you know it, it's more expensive than you think. But yes, it's a fraction of of having the the, uh, the real thing. Yes, for sure. <laughs> uh, Anisha, I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, Anisha's on a number of corporate boards. Um, I was, I was gonna pivot a little bit away from COVID-19 and onto um, the board's role in evaluating programs and staff. Um, I, I guess more of the analogy for you would be about, um, uh, and where you have a tremendous expertise is in evaluating people. Um, at the board level, um, advice on uh, what the board can be doing to that's appropriate for them because they are not the direct managers of the staff. Um, you know, from my recovering lawyer days, I defer to Justin and Jennifer and Jose here. Uh, but I, I believe that the board is meant to be evaluating the executive director and the executive director is evaluating his or her team. But at the, what, what is the responsibility for the board in terms of um, evaluating the staff? Um, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, clearly, uh, 
you know, most, most boards and certainly most progressive boards have been focused on um, creating value um, uh, and, and uh, beyond, beyond uh, traditional governance mechanisms. And um, uh, management of uh, a CEO's um, performance and uh, management of a CEO's incentives is, uh, is, is fairly critical to creation of uh, value in, in any uh, uh, company. Uh, the, the, the board's role is, uh, is paramount and uh, the board's role is vital here. Yeah. And I, in many ways, uh, I think that uh, the board, it's, it's a central part of uh, what the board is uh, supposed to do, which is to help manage a CEO's uh, performance incentives, link with strategy and ensure that the strategy is working. Um, practices that I've seen that have worked well have started off with uh, uh, asking the CEO to uh, come up with uh, uh, a, a paper on where they wanna take the company in that specific year and over, over years and, um, and uh, surveying the board members uh, uh, and, and providing feedback back to the CEO on the objectives. But then at the end of the year and during the course of the year to uh, periodically ask the CEO to come up with a paper on how they feel they're doing against these, those objectives. And, uh, and, and likewise, surveying the board members and, and engaging the CEO in a dialogue around where they might be doing well and where they could do, do better. The serving the board members on their own performance, like we discussed in the last panel, or on the performance of the executive director, or both? So, uh, it, so I, I was talking about the role of the CEO, uh, and, uh, and, and I was talking about serving the, starting off with a self-assessment first, and engaging the CEO in the dialogue, and uh, serving the board members, and then providing feedback to the CEO. Uh, I think uh, I, I think it's it's very important for boards to engage in peer reviews and in reviews of the executive director as well. Uh, not all boards do it. Uh, it it is helpful when it's done and approached constructively. Um, so, Jeff, on the many boards on which you sit and have sat, what sort of tools for evaluating the executive director have you seen be particularly effective? And and also less effective and, and in, in retrospect, really not worth um, doing anymore. Uh, probably the, um, one of the uh, uh, boards I sit on, they have a governance committee, which uh, basically reviews um, the performance of the directors um, as well as um, all the way up uh, through, the, um, through the chairman and um, on that particular board, we have term limits. So they're, uh, uh, they're important in terms of asking whether we're gonna, uh, deciding whether we're gonna ask somebody to uh, serve another term. Uh, so that's been, I think that's, that's worked well. Uh, they're, it's a small group of um, senior people on the board. So um, it's, you know, their uh, opinions are taken seriously. Uh -huh. So you, um, not to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like you are a supporter of term limits. I, I like that. I think that's like a way limits. of managing a board. So uh -huh. it's, it's interesting because the first panel seemed to be leaning a little bit away from term limits. I'd love to just do a quick go around with this panel of uh, where you all come out on term limits because I actually think that this particular second panel favors term limits, but let me not put words in. Uh, Mindy, where are you on term limits, pros and cons? Uh, you know, I, I am all in on term limits. I think, uh, I think it's necessary, mandatory, and um, uh, enforceable. And, you know, if somebody is that amazing, they could roll off after, after their three three-year terms and become an advisor. There are other ways to engage wonderful people. Um, and you may want to bring them back or put them, like I said, on advisory. We have uh, some great ex-presidents that are on an investment committee or sit on finance, but term limits, uh, exclamation point, underscore, great way to refresh your board and, um, and, and continue to have growth. Uh, Anish, where do you come out on term limits? Oh, uh, Anish, you're on mute. <laughs> 
Sorry, sorry about that. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of term limits, a uh, huge supporter of it. I, I think uh, it provides, um, you know, opportunities to diversify uh, the board. I, I think it avoids the perpetual customer, or sorry, the, the concentration of power that sometimes you find uh, in boards. It, it allows you to uh, rotate committee assignments. Uh, it allows you the opportunity to work with a few people who might have only a few years to devote. Uh, uh, and and uh, so there are lots lots of benefits of uh, ter term limits. Big supporter of it. Uh, I I think to um, Mindy's points, there are some uh, some cons to it as well. There's some potential loss of organizational memory uh, when you do that. But but it can be it can be managed. And if somebody is a super uh, board member, like Mindy mentioned, uh, you know, engage that person as an advisor. Mr. Mindy and Anish are correct. There's no doubt about it. But I also, it's sometimes, I think, I hope I'm not, I may be the only one that feels sometimes it's easier said than done. And perhaps when you have a smaller organization, a little more fragile in terms of the history of fundraising, there are people who are almost, they're the institution, not so much the memory, they're just the heart, they're the soul. And you really don't want, you need them there. You know, you may not need them as the head of that committee. So I'm very torn. I've had something recently where I realized we do need to be more clear. But I have to say, every time we go to be clear, the vision of the three or four people who you never want to lose somehow gets detracts from the conversation. I, th I think Mindy has something to add here. So, so I sat next to somebody at, when we were able to sit next to people at a, at a gala, <laughs> and he was... Um, adamantly against term limits and he said it cost his uh, performing arts where he was the chair of the board five to ten million dollars and being written in the will. I get that but I also think that if you are, have clarity of getting people on onboarding and you have expectations and the love and the passion there are ways to continue to engage people um, and if you need a title come up with a title but but it's different than refreshing and quite frankly, um, there is a new generation that also needs to be brought in. So it's, it's the way to do that. So, but I, I hear you on the clarity on the fundraising. I just think oh. we need to be creative about it. And, and Jennifer, I'm gonna be the contrarian, agree with you. And also the, the prior panel was very much against term limits. So it's very, very interesting. I'd love to see where yeah. Jose comes out. I know where Justin comes out. I wanna hear him talk about yeah. it though. <laughs> I'm sort of a bit, I mean, look, I think uh, as, as every, every non-for-profit is, you know, exceedingly different, right? There's so many different types of non-for-profits. And at least in our case at Latino Justice, we had a bit of an organizational rebuild about 15 years ago. And a, a lot of fresh blood was brought in. Our board is a young board by, you know, many standards. It's, you know, a lot of our folks are 40 to 50, right? And, and even in the 40 to 45 year range, we see it as a, as a um, you know, we see it as a leadership pipeline. So we are refreshing, we are bringing in, we have term limits for the executive uh, positions. But, but we've, you know, we've found that we need the institutional memory um, and we haven't found that it's blocking new blood from getting in. We have lots of new board members. So I think it just depends on the organization. In our case, I would say that, it, it could be det detrimental if we had term limits. Um, Jose, thank you so much for that. Before we hear from Justin, I just want to say for people who joined late, one of the things that um, we talked about in the first panel and Jennifer brought up, which was very helpful, is for organizations sometimes that don't have term limits, one great tool that boards can use is to have everyone resign at once and then rejoin with a new contract. So that can be a way of, if you have somebody who's been with the organization for a long time, you don't know how to get rid of them because you don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Everyone resigns and everybody rejoins with a new contract. And so that, that can be sort of um, a halfway point if you're an organization that doesn't believe in term limits but wants to engage people. Justin, we, I'd love to hear from you on where you come out on term limits, pros and cons. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure you do know what I think about term limits, <laughs> Cynthia. Only because I'm not sure I know what I think about them. I, I think everyone who has spoken so far spoke pretty eloquently about the tension that you try to manage between institutional memory and, you know, freshening up the board. Um, I, I do worry that that in situations, for instance, where you have a long-serving executive director, 
um, and where, well, they might well have outlasted every board member, um, which means that when it's time to do a search for a new executive director, one of the most important functions the board will ever do, right? Remember, the board has one employee only. Um, there might be no one who has institutional memory of, of the prior search, and uh, the search can be um, very, 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 how you conduct a search will vary depending on the culture of the institution. That can be very problematic. I, I will make the observation that what the board looks like it does with term limits might not actually be what the board does with term limits. Mm. So I'm involved with one organization that does not have term limits as a statutory matter of the bylaws, but it is well understood on that board that after two five-year terms, the board members are to um, step down unless there's some extraordinary circumstance. They have a particular skill, they're, they're a leading real estate developer, and there's a new building going up, right? Or some, some particular match that requires, their, requires them to stay effectively. Um, I'm on another board where there are statutory term limits, but where the board is, is very much in the habit of taking people at the expiration of their uh, term uh, and putting them on an advisory council for a one year cooling off period and then cycling them back onto the board. So that's one mechanism that some boards use to try to solve or some of the issues that you're talking about. Only once before did I see a very interesting mechanism. I'm not even sure if it's legal under New York not-for-profit law, I just don't know, um, but they did it. Um, and that was that, that the majority of board members had terms that lasted for X, uh, but then there were effectively these sort of super delegate board members uh, who had much longer terms. Uh, and that was an attempt to maintain institutional memory while still allowing for the bulk of the board to turn over. So there are different mechanisms that people have developed to try to solve for the tension that everyone on this, on this panel has identified. I would say one thing, Cynthia, however, whatever the policy is, boards should be really advised to do it well, though. Because I know for myself, I've, I was on one of those boards, Justin, where I guess there was a policy, but it wasn't very clear up front. And I remember getting a letter that felt like the sex in the city breaking up with you on a post-it. It's like, you know, thank you for your service. And it's like, but I like this board. <laughs> and I'm pretty busy. So I think in having some expectation and delivery of message is important. Jennifer, for the second time in a row, you started talking right before I was about to call on you. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you keep doing that. It's amazing. We're on the same wavelength. I was going to ask you because you are one of the most um, uh, effective um, uh, people I have ever worked with in the 20 years of board assist at engaging their board. Jennifer is the queen of engaging her board. She is the poster child for how you did that effectively. So I'd love to ask all of you, starting with Jennifer, the queen of board engagement, uh, to, because that's, that's, that's really mainly, you know, with the term limits, it's about bringing in new blood, but you know, if we're honest, one of the biggest reasons you have term limits is because your board is getting stale and, and you're not just bringing in new blood for fairness and equity, you're bringing in new blood because the old blood kind of isn't doing their job anymore. So that doesn't happen if you're on one of Jennifer's boards because she's so phenomenal at engaging her board. So um, tools that you've used that have been effective, do you assign, at, uh, have you ever like had a board mentor? Do you have onboarding documents? What works, what doesn't work um, in terms of just keeping the board engaged and caring about your organization? Thank you for those really kind words. And I think it's, you know, it's, some of it is real simple psychology that I'm sure my fellow panelists use, which is really why is this person on the board? What's important to them? So. I had a very interesting challenge coming to Hunter. I've been there for almost 20 years, which is, I think most college presidents last around six and a half. So I guess, what's that question? But one of the challenges within the city university, and I think, you know, Mindy being in another public you know, university system, the fund, fundraising has never been preeminent in, the pub, in most of these smaller public colleges, right? Some of the big publics, yes. So you needed to change a culture. And you needed to find people who would stand with you to really understand the need to really be the cheerleaders for this institution and then to help find resources. 
So finding people who could connect with a piece of the mission has really been like my critical playbook. So we have a lot of alums on the board and they're originally, well, you went to Hunter, you should care. So that's one formula. But we have a phenomenal art department, as you know, because I've enlisted, you know, your better half to work with our art department. So you find people who care passionately about art and God bless, you know, Jeffrey may not be asking them to be on the board of the Met with him, but they can <laughs> be on Hunter's art board and they can feel involved with young artists. How cool is that? Same thing with music, with budding pre-law. You find, you know, many of us in the profession, we love to talk to people who want to be lawyers. So it's really so mission driven. What matters? What do we need? And how do we find people who care about that, whether they're alums or not? And then it's this cheerleading. It's the drink the Kool-Aid. Why is what we're doing so important? And why is every little contribution you could make, whether it's speaking to students, finding internships, helping us with small gifts, doing an event for us that introduces other people to our mission. So it's really the care and feeding of board members. It's, and I take it personally as you know, the president of the college. And I think that's another commitment people have to make. You can delegate, you can have staff, but that personal connection from the leader to the board member about why you matter and you're showing up matters and not, sometimes maybe it is just writing the check, but often it's, we need you, we need you to represent, we need you to tell your friends to stand by our school, our product, our mission. That personal touch just can't be replaced by staff, I believe. Jennifer, I, I have, I have seen the master at work you doing this. And um, I, I, I'm so glad you laid it out that way because I think it's so helpful for our attendees to hear. In the prior panel, um, they talked about the board chair or the executive director reaching out at least once a year to each board member to talk about their experience. But um, what I realized as you said this, um, seeing you at work all year long, is you do it 365 days out of the year. Um, and that if you can do it more than just once a year and not just a check-in of where you say to Anish, Anish, how's it going on the board this year? Uh, what can we be doing for you? You take it to a whole other level uh, when you sit down with Anish, you say, you know, Anish, I noticed you seem really interested in that literacy, that, that, that um, creative writing program we have. Would you like to be involved in that? So that seems like it's a whole different level that you bring to it of not just going to the board member and saying, what can we do for you? But going prepared because you've been watching all year long, what part of your programming really resonates with that board member. And then you, you, I see you do this all the time with the people that we've placed with you. You go to them with something very specific um, because sometimes just saying, you know, how can we engage you more in the program? It's too amorphous. You target it in so narrowly of, you know, I noticed your daughter loves the, uh, loves going to the ballet. You know, we have a dance program here at Hunter. Would, uh, would you guys like to be involved in that? So I, I, I think that's such a great point that you made. It is, you make it a 365 day a year job. And that's why your board is so engaged and cares. Um, Jeff, you're on a lot of Boards, there's, board. there's a reason there's a reason why Jennifer needs to do that though which is that there's a structural impediment to engagement on not-for-profit boards which is that that needs to be overcome in Jennifer's case it sounds like very effectively which is that not-for-profit boards are too big and Anish who constructs for-profit boards will probably tell me that a for-profit board should be maybe seven people, maybe nine, somewhere like that for optimal decision-making. Uh, Not-for-profit boards are usually 20, 30 people, something like that because of the fundraising component. You asked on the last panel what the difference was between not-for-profit and for-profit boards. That's one of many. Uh, and that requires um, a set of different solutions to encourage engagement. And I think you will find, not to suggest that, that what might be one of the next topics, but uh, that that basically begs the importance of the committee structure on boards. And, and you're absolutely, actually right. We, we very much wanted to talk about committees, um, but um, we're so quickly losing time because we're having such a robust discussion. Jeff, I'd, I'd love to hear from you as somebody who has, sat and sits on the board of very large nonprofits with very large boards. 
What have you seen been effective tools for onboarding and board engagement? Well, I think, I, I think it starts at the beginning of trying to find um, candidates for the board that kind of share the mission. I, I, my, my experience is if you can find people who really identify with, with the organization, you're, you're ahead of the game at the beginning. Um, and then I think it's very common to assign them to a partner, somebody who's already on the board, not so much a mentor, but somebody just to kind of check in with them and see, um, see how the first year's going. One of the things that one of the boards that I'm on does is they don't really, uh, a lot of time they don't assign them to committees for the first six months. They say, mm. come on the board, you know, come to some of the board meetings, you know, listen to the committee reports, kind of, you know, feel, uh, try and pick your own a little bit. Now, if they have a specialty, um, like they're a CEO of a technology company, we'll probably put them on the digital committee or something like that. Um, but that works. The other um, uh, co uh, comment you had in the earlier session was um, self-assessment for the directors. And I was on a board and, and I actually thought that was a good idea uh, because I thought a lot of stuff came out that um, might not come out in um, you know, open, uh, open conversation. And it was just an easy way for the powers that be to hear what, what the board was really thinking. And if you had a particular um, uh, point of view that you were trying to push, it was another way to, uh, to push it. Um, but I think just in general, uh, kind of communication, getting the boards together twice a year for dinners, uh, you know, uh, trying to break up, uh, you know, if, 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 if there are four or five that know each other very well, you know, don't seat them at the same table at the dinner. Uh, you know, I think this is kind of, to me, this probably is the same as in a for-profit uh, situation. It's, uh, it's understanding what people want and trying to, uh, trying to break down, um, you know, some of the barriers. Jeff, this is, this is so helpful. And I suspect you're one of the few people on this panel who has sat on a board where they did assign board partners to new board members. So you guys have seen that be an effective strategy that's worth employing. Yeah, we, li we, we like that. We like that. I thought Justin's comment um, about the size of boards and committee, I mean, uh, for, for some of the larger institutions, when you get done with elective trustees, uh, historical trustees, a meriti, um, you know, it's 100 people. So the real committee, uh, the real work and the real discussion, I think it's done in the committees. There's no question about it. And, and the board meetings are a little bit more like a, uh, like a town hall. You right. Know, here's what we're doing. So um, uh, before we lose Anish and this panel, because he is the HR guru of, of our entire summit, uh, I would be remiss not asking Anish to chime in on this question of, of how you engage your board and keep them engaged. Well, thank you for that, Cynthia. Now I cannot wait for, to hear myself speak. <laughs> <laughs> And really, two, two comments. You know, one, uh, uh, one. I think it's really important to uh, bring on to the board somebody who truly is grateful to be on the board and grateful for the opportunity to serve. Uh, just having been uh, on on boards as, as the others, it's it's a lot of work when it has to be done well. And and if the person's not fully committed, I think I think it's worth thinking twice. Maybe titles can be used. Um, in, in various ways to, to support fundraising, but, but, but bringing somebody who's truly committed and engaged and grateful, I think, uh, is, is important. Uh, the only other thing I would suggest would be uh, perhaps uh, thinking of goals uh, for, for each board member and encourage them to take on a goal that they feel passionately about or that they have competency in. You know, I believe that you know, you give me a KPI and I'll use it as a lever to move a mountain. And, uh, you know, and so just gently encouraging the board members to, to take on a goal or a KPI might, might help. So you, you talked about goals a lot in, um, in this panel and that just, that's so important. I mean, you would know better than anyone how important that is. And I don't think, I, I never hear about this. I never hear about board members sending, setting individual goals for the year. 
You hear about maybe the board setting goals for the executive director, not so much the executive director setting goals for themselves. And I never hear about individual board members setting goals. I and mean, what a great takeaway for everyone to have from today. I think that that would be such a great practice. Jose, you're nodding your head. So before we lose you, I'd love to hear from you, um, for you as, as a former board chair, um, what you've done to keep board members, to engage them initially and keep them engaged. One uh, credential Jose left off his long list of credentials was he was the board chair of an organization called Project Explorer where we placed him. Um, I'm very proud of that. And he has all these other things he's proud of, but he did have his hands full um, with this organization trying to keep people engaged because it was a smaller organization and it had a very dynamic founder executive director who um, was for some easier to partner with than others. So Jose, like what, did, what strategies did you use that were effective? So I would say, you know, just specifically on Project Explorer, which is a smaller organization, um, you know, fundraising was big. It was hard to find really good members. It was an, you know, a really um, you know, the goals, the mission of the organization was really compelling, but it was just hard to find people that would be really committed. Um, I would say that, you know, I was taking notes while Jennifer was speaking. She clearly has this down to an art and um, maybe even a science, but I would say I was using some of those skills as well. I thought the one-on-one, -on -one, I was handpicking every single board member in a way, and I was trying to fit them into the puzzle of where they belonged in, 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 in sort of the spectrum of what we had, what we needed, the goals, what their interests were, and where I can sort of where I can engage them. And so I was, I thought it was a very much of a, of a bespoke approach, right? Every single person, I needed to connect with them at least a few times a year and really try to gauge what they wanted to do and, 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 and where they can add the most value. And I've carried that over, obviously, in, in, in Latino just as much more developed. But again, it's, it's, it's the same sort of approach, a, a more uh, focused on the person and a bit more bespoke. No, and, and Jose, because I work so closely with most of those people who became your board members, um, you were extremely effective at doing that. And, um, you know, I, I do get a lot of calls from people and emails complaining about their board chair and how they're not listening. And that was that was never an issue with Jose. Everybody always felt that he he was Thank you. very, uh, but no, really, you were a superstar with that. So um, it was very easy for me to pick you um, and hope that you'd be free to do this panel today. Uh, so before this panel cycles off, um, does anyone have something that they would like to add before we maybe see you again at 6.15? I'd, I'd add something just that that last set of comments from, from Jose brought to mind, which is that the board chair's outreach to board members is in an interesting context that everyone always sorts of sort of ignores. And that's that while boards themselves operate reasonably democratically, and people take votes on all sorts of things. Um, it's usually the case that the board chair has not been selected particularly democratically, right? That he's usually been selected, usually, um, by previous board leadership, and then there's sort of a vote of a slate or something like that. That's usually the case, um, which is sort of an interesting and unusual dynamic. And I think in that case, it really is incumbent on the board chair to do what Jose did you know, no one ever campaigns to be board chair, just the opposite. Sometimes it, it reflects the failure <laughs> of campaigning to you know, step backwards fast enough. Um, but <laughs> when you are a board chair, I, I think it's incumbent on you then to, to, that's when your campaigning starts because that's when you need to do the reach out to all the other board members that, that Jose was describing. I just wanted to, to bring up that, that dynamic. And then the second and last comment I wanted to make was as I listened to the description of setting goals, uh, from Anish and, and others, um, to me, the single biggest trap in, in, in being on a not-for-profit board is just becoming the, the, the listener, just becoming the rapt audience to um, staff reports and becoming a prisoner of that. And in some ways, the better and more effective the staff is, the easier that is. And it really is incumbent on boards to also produce, as part of their brief, real generative thinking. That's important. Can, can you flesh that out a little bit more? I, I guess another way of saying that is that is that um, strategy and, and maybe even challenging sometimes an executive director, sometimes saying, hey, you're running a, a terrific ship. 
what are the moonshots? You know, what's the crazy dream you have? Um, you know, that's, that's sometimes useful. And providing real strategic input, tactical input is almost always beyond the ken of a board member in a not-for-profit. Not only should we not, not only should we not do it, we cannot. Um, strategy is sometimes different. Right. Um, thank you all second panelists. Um, we hope to see some of you back at 615 for our open Q&A and, and we really very much appreciate your time today and learned so much from you. I'm now going to introduce our third panel, um, starting with Ali Alibhai, who is a managing director in mergers and acquisitions at City. Um, he serves as the vice chair of the Board of uh, Education Through Music, where he was placed by Board Assist. Um, and the president of the Aga Khan Ismaili Council for the Northeast, where through their Aga Khan Development Network, they have a deep connection to development initiatives across the globe, as well as a focus on the arts through the Aga Khan Museum, Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and Aga Khan Music Initiative, amongst others. Um, we have with us Debjani Bachki. Um, she's a managing director and senior portfolio manager at Deutsche Bank. Uh, she's a member of the Investment Advisory Investment Committee, providing oversight on all the investment portfolios managed by Deutsche Bank. Uh, Debjani currently sits on the board of Read Alliance, where we're proud to say she was placed by board assist. Uh, Debjani is a member of the CFA Institute, CFA Society New York, and Women on Wall Street. Uh, early in her career, she worked at the World Bank, United Nations Capital Development Fund, and Women's World Banking. Uh, we have with us Jeannie Kwong Bickford, who is um, a managing director and senior partner at the Boston Consulting Group. She's the managing partner leading BCG's New York office and a member of the management team for the financial institutions practice in North America, specializing in risk and compliance. She's also a core member of the people and organization practice focused on change management for large multi multifaceted transformations. Jeannie is serving her second three-year term on the National Board of the Girl Scouts of the USA. Uh, this triennium, she's an officer of the board as the second vice president and a member of the finance committee. Jeannie currently co-leads GS USA's COVID board task force utilizing her strategic risk management and change management skill set to support the organization. We have with us Debbie Farrington, who is co-founder and managing partner of StoryVest Partners, a New York City-based venture capital firm investing in technology-enabled business services with a focus on software as e-service, data and analytics, and internet marketing. It's one of the largest women majority-owned venture capital firms in the United States. Debbie's been on the Forbes Midas 100 list of top venture capitalists multiple times and the top woman on the list in 2008 and 2011. She sits on the board of Smith College where she serves as chair of the Smith College Investment Committee. She's also a board member of the HBS Club of New York, a longtime member of the Business Committee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and sits on the board of the American Friends of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and the advisory board of WQXR. She has served on over 25 private and public boards, so she is going to be a fabulous panelist for us today. Uh, we have with us Sandy Lee. She's a managing director of Kinneret Group, a private investment firm. At Kinneret, she works on third-party investments as well as the expression of values within family members' portfolios. Prior to Kinneret, Sandy had collaborated extensively um, with institutions, pension plans, and private investors on alternative investments and fintech initiatives. She is a co-founder of 87 Capital, worked at the DE Shaw Group, and began her finance career on Morgan Stanley's fixed income desk in New York. Sandy serves on the board of the Yale Club of New York City, the Joan Mitchell Foundation, and the Van Allen Institute. She's also taught at New York University and the Parsons School of Design. And finally, we have Luke Sarsfield with us. Um, he's a partner at Goldman Sachs, where he serves as a global head of the GS asset management client business with global sales and client relationship management responsibility for the firm's institutional and retail client assets. Previously, Luke held a number of senior leadership roles within GS's investment banking division, including serving as global head of fin financial institutions group, global COO of the investment banking division, and head of the healthcare group. 
currently Luke serves as Vice President of the Board of Trustees of the Montclair Kimberly Academy and is a board member of Safe Horizon, the largest victim services agency in the United States. Previously, Luke served as board chair for Literacy Inc. We are board assists, it's proud to have placed him. We're also very proud to have placed Luke's wife, Jody on the board of Catholic Guardian Services. So that is the fabulous panel that we end with today. Um, Debbie and Jeannie, if you can come off of mute, that'll move you to the top of the um, panel's lineup. Sandy as well. Uh, Johnny, I don't know if you're with us. We don't um, see or, uh, or hear Deb Johnny. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you all so much um, for being with us today. We really appreciate your time. And uh, we're getting through barely anything on our list of things to cover because there is so much <laughs> to cover. Uh, but we are having a lot of fun, or at least I am, and I, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, Jeannie, um, as I was reading that um, and seeing that you are on the COVID committee for Girl Scouts, we did talk about COVID in an earlier panel for a little bit, but I would be remiss not talking about COVID with you now because this is obviously something you have a lot of expertise in at the moment. Um, what what has the Girl Scouts done to respond to COVID? What's been particularly effective that might help other boards um, that you've seen at the board level with COVID respond? Yeah, so I think, um, well, great question, tough question, right? So I think that for Girl Scouts of the USA, the real challenge has been this question of, well, how will this unfold? So if you understand how the Girl Scouts works, um, a large percentage of our fundraising comes from cookie sales. And um, everything went remote and um, restrictions were put in place with our girls who were selling cookies in March, in the middle of our cookie season. And so a lot of it had to do with, first of all, there was rapid response that really it was staff that was responsible for, which was really figuring out, you know, how to move to digital right, delivery of our programs how to move to digital cookie, which is our, our uh, ability to sell and, and distribute cookies using our digital channels. Um, but then it became very clear that from a board perspective, you do all those emergency things, but then what does the outlook look like? What do you need to do and how do you think about it? And so the board COVID committee really had spent its time working through what are the different scenarios. So, so going through scenario planning to really play out what are different states of the world that can occur? What does that mean for our operations and our financial health, right? Which really forced, really, I would say, forethought around, okay, how, does it, how might this look? So we actually did run through scenarios of what happens with school. So if you think, if you go back to April, May, we were talking about well, what happens if schools don't open? How do we recruit new girls into our programs? How do you deliver programs? Um, you know, playing that forward, what does it do to our membership and the finances? And how do we think about cookie and our cookie program in January? So all of those things were very vital from a, I would say a strategic governance perspective to lay out those, those perspectives on different states of the world. We went from everything from best case to dystopian to really think about from a fiduciary perspective, what will we need to do in terms of our, of our finances and, and whether it was getting the PPP um, financing through to, you know, what do we have to do with our workforce? What do we, how do we think about fund development? Because clearly fund development took a hit because it's a different focus right, at the moment, which is really about emergency support for, for folks versus, you know, in the donor population thinking perhaps maybe longer term around our, our programs around girls and, and their leadership. So I think that that was the piece that was the big piece that as a board member, A, I could, I could bring, right, the skill set that I have, but actually pull in the right skill sets from amongst our mm -hmm. group of board members, we have 30, um, to really work through those scenarios, work with management in terms of what are triggers what are the different trigger points? So we actually have trigger points. We have thought through different contingency plans. And I think that that puts us in a better situation where we're not always reacting, which I think is the critical piece. So it sounds like at Girl Scout, the board was very engaged in this process of responding to COVID. 
it in wasn't just left to the staff. At the, at the board level, there was a lot of engagement. That is correct. Um, and, oh. So I'm wondering with the other panelists in this segment, um, it sounds like Debbie has something to add here. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we promised the attendees we were going to talk about that board staff live, which is always something very, a hot issue with any nonprofit. Um, in a crisis like this with COVID-19, um, you know, maybe some of the rules get thrown out of it. We talked in the last panel about the rules on dipping into the endowment getting thrown out. How, how has COVID-19 impacted the board staff line and how involved at the board level have your organizations um, been involved in responding to COVID-19? Well, Cynthia, um, I'd be happy to respond to that. Um, being on the board of Smith College, we had to address a lot of the same issues that Jean mentioned. Do we open or not? Do the students come back? And we pivoted a lot. And one of the ways that we addressed this was we set up task forces. We had a finance task force. We had, um, you know, an education and staff task force. And we met intensively. I was meeting, I had two meetings a week for Smith College um, when we were making these decisions because first we decided that we were going to open up in July and then COVID got worse, especially from some of the areas where we were drawing students and so we decided we will not open the college in the fall. We will teach remotely. So how do we do that? We also had about, I guess, 100 or 200 students there who couldn't leave because they were international. So we had a lot of um, very tough decisions to make. And what do we do then about the money? How much do we charge? How much of a hole will this leave for us? How do we use the endowment? So we did make the decision not to open up in the fall. We did um, have actually, we had no idea how many people would want to participate in remote learning. And luckily we had quite a few. We did make decisions about the price. We dropped the price a little bit. And of course people were not paying for room and board. So there was a savings that way. And then relating to what Jean said about scenario planning, we had to do this because we had a bit, we had a hole in our budget and we had to make decisions about the endowment. So we did decide to increase our draw a little bit. Luckily, it didn't have to be too much because we were able to um, charge, I think, more than we thought before. But this was a real crisis with um, never before seen issues. Never before had we had to make the decision, do we open or not? And so going through all of that with the scenario planning, and it actually, worked extremely well, everybody stepped up, and we made the decision to postpone a lot of vital decisions, and we've brought them back onto the table now, because we've decided, in a sense, this is the new normal, if you can call it that, and we now know how to cope with it. We know some of the decisions um, that are coming at us. We know how our constituency will respond, professors, staff members, students, and so that's given us some confidence in being able to plan. So what we're looking at now, do we open up in the spring or not? Um, and what if we have to change again? So I think we've gotten more comfortable with some of the uncertainty, but above all, communication from the top has been essential. I can't emphasize that enough from both all the nonprofit boards I'm on, especially the for-profit boards. We've seen CEOs really step up and that ability to communicate and effective communication, how you do that with the board, how you do that with your ELT and, and, um, and team members has been critical. So I would emphasize that that's been a key part of how I've seen leaders deal with this crisis successfully. Um, Debbie, that's so helpful. And I'm, I'm seeing Luke nodding vigorously and, and he and Ali both um, serve on boards that are serving children and the education space. Um, and so I'd, I'd love to hear Luke and Ali jump in on this issue as well. Well, I, I'm happy to jump in and then um, maybe Ali, you can go and, and I'll give a rather more mundane example where I think some of the dynamics have shifted and, and boards have had to, you know, in the right way, inject themselves into things that maybe historically you would have left to the staff. For me, where that really struck home was around our gala and 
most of you who know, a, a significant portion of fundraising for many not-for-profits happens at, you know, one of these rubber chicken dinners when you cram 500 people into a ballroom and then ask them to give money. And it's been a very effective mechanism to do that for many, many years and engages the board and engages the broader community. Obviously, with COVID, uh, the prospects of being able to do that potentially for an extended period of time have changed and have changed meaningly, meaningfully. And I think initially, you know, when, when you had a, a great staff who had been doing this for years and years, the first reaction was maybe we should postpone it. The next reaction is maybe we should do it virtually. Both of those may be sound approaches to it. Um, but I think for us at least, and I know the earlier panel talked about this a little bit, the board really said, let's, let's kind of think about this and let's really think about the ways we're engaging with our donor base and is there kind of a new, novel, more creative way we can and should be engaging with them? Clearly, there's going to be always important to have an element of human engagement. Galas, I presume at some point in the future, will be a, a part of that again. But, but this whole concept of stewarding the donor base becomes, I think, incredibly important, particularly at a time when for many organizations, the supply lines are severely strained and the economic challenges are, are significant. And so really having the board be much more engaged in making what you might have thought were historical kind of blocking and tackling or logistical decisions that now have real strategic import for the organization was something where I thought, you know, the, what you might have thought was those traditional board staff lines got blurred for us. Ali, what would you, Luke, thank you so much. I think that's so helpful. Ali, what would you add to that? Sure, uh, I'm happy to, to share perspective. So, um, you know, our ETM is, is partnered with the public uh, school system in, in New York City. And so, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, uh, when, when COVID hit, um, you know, we were, you know our, we were shut down and we had a funding gap. And so the first order of business was really to identify how we were going to manage um, our funding gap so that the board and notably the executive committee of the board worked very closely with the staff to identify how we were going to um, address the near term issues. And then on top of that, we had the longer term issues of what does the next fiscal year look like? And just to reflect on some of the comments that uh, Jeannie and, and Deborah made, I mean, and and it, it, it was it was interesting because it, you know, I was, I was having the, this dialogue with my clients around scenario planning and liquidity. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, we're, we're, it's, the, it's the, the central issue at the ETM board where we started running scenarios because we didn't know what the New York public school system would look like um, it, starting in September, you know. And so, so we had to, um, and that affects us in a couple of different ways. One is it affects how we serve the population but also affects us from a revenue standpoint. Um, and so uh, we had to really think through and, and we, were, we, we, we were very nimble in, in adapting to um, the, the, the various, uh, the, the timelines, how they got pushed out, but also the various scenarios that, um, that we were, um, that we were uh, uh, studying. Um, so that's, that, th that really did require a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, uh, um, collaboration between uh, the the board and the executive committee and the staff and we worked very closely together and, and, and it did shed some light on uh, other things within the organization I think as Luke raised the the gala and the fundraising efforts how we would work around not having a physical gala um, because that is one of our large fundraising uh, initiatives and the other thing is it, it helped us better understand our budgeting process because you know, when everything's going well and is consistent and steady, um, you know, the, we just take the process for granted. But because we had to really go in and dissect our budgeting process and, and work from the bottoms up, it helped us revisit that process and, and, um, and make sure that we were looking at all aspects of, of the budget. Uh, you brought up something that, um, that I was going to ask next, so thank you for doing that. Uh, and that is um, the board's involvement and engagement in um, evaluating programming um, and how effective it is when we're not in a pandemic. Uh, just in general, uh, practices that you've seen be particularly effective um, with the board's engagement in, a, in evaluating programming. Um, can you can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah. I'm happy against um you see and the the um, I, you're, you're cutting in and out um is everyone else hearing Ali like that 
I'm cutting out. Um, can I suggest okay. one thing you could do is um, you could log off and come back on. Also, may, I may pass that to someone. You're still cutting in and out. Also, can people hear me? Can somebody um, send a Q and A that I was a little verbal? Jeannie, I'm fine. No, you you are Arabic or pixelating. <laughs> I'm fixing. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Sandy to answer this question about evaluating um, uh, program effectiveness, and I'm going to log off and come back on. So Sandy, you're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, program effectiveness in a normal year. Um, one, you know, one thing that I've found super helpful, and I'm very glad to be participating. One thing I've found super helpful is being able to benchmark um, with board members uh, from peer organizations. So understanding from at least the finance perspective, understanding whether we're running something efficiently um, compared to our peers, and if we're not, are there choices that we are consciously making? Um, around that, or or are they, um, or is it just spending creep, and can we deal with that? Um, um, and so it's 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 complicated, I will say, from the finance seat, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this as well. Um, I find that um, uh, working from the finance perspective, uh, one is always trying to get other non-finance board members to trust. Uh, that you're not just always looking to slash, um, and then also to get staff comfortable that 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 your work is aligned with theirs. Um, so so there's this dual. I find this dual work that needs to be done around um, demonstrating your alignment, mission alignment on the on that side, and also ensuring that you're doing your fiduciary duty around budget, um, under, both understanding the budget. Um, in a granular manner um, and understanding how that relates to peers. Um, I think Cynthia's back, uh, specific to 2020, and I'm, uh, my experience I think sounds very similar from uh, to Jean's and Allie's, is that uh, there's been a lot of scenario planning, um, thinking about trigger points when certain, uh, when, when we might uh, move to action plans that we hope never to use, um, that it has been, uh, I found that where the board staff line has gotten very fuzzy for me has been around pushing staff to face uh, what they might not wish to emotionally and having them build models that we hope we don't use. And that, that has actually been a, has taken most of my time these past few months. Um, this is, um, first of all, am, can you all hear me better now, Sandy? Yeah, yes. that's much better. Okay, am, okay. I, am I back? You and me? you're better. You're back okay. now too. So okay. you're back on, Ollie. <laughs> what were you going to say? Uh, so you, you would ask the question about programming. Look, um, you know, we do have a dedicated uh, part of the board, a committee dedicated to programming. But where uh, where we've um, we've spent uh, a lot of time in the past couple of years is around evaluation and how we measure programming, and that's really important as we think about um, our our beneficiaries and our funders. And so, you know, let me ask you all the question, how do you measure the impact of music education, right? And it's not something you can measure on a day-to-day -day basis. It's something you need to measure long-term because it, it does impact um, and enhance uh, academic performance. And, and that's, that's our view. And, and, um, and so we have spent a lot more time on, on measuring programming, uh, it's, it's, it's part art, it's part science, uh, but, but that's something that the board is heavily focused on. So, because um, I think this is so interesting, and I know because I've been working with ETM for so long, I know you do that so effectively um, at ETM. How can you be a little bit more specific about how the board has been involved with developing those metrics? Yeah, so there's two two parts to it. One is, um, you know, the the evaluation team that uh, the the board works very the the committee I should say works very closely with the evaluation team, um, and uh, you know we we had uh, up until recently we had um, you know an act an actual PhD who was who was heading up our evaluation um, uh, department and uh, and and it's the 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 uh, the work that's been done is. First of all, figure, figuring out what's measurable. So the board has been involved, um, and and what we want to, what what we think is important to be able to articulate 
to our, again, to our beneficiaries and to our funders. Um, and then how we can go about measuring it. And again, you have to keep in mind in the school system, there's certain things we can do and there's certain things we can't do. Um, so, you know, really laying out that framework and making sure that uh, we can work closely with staff so they can make uh, meaningful progress on um, uh, in this area. So I, I think that's um, the board staff um, function um, partnership working at its very best in that um, I'll, you know, as somebody who is a nonprofit staff member, um, you know, um, and speaking for the staff side on, uh, at the summit, you know, what happens is we're very involved in our day to day um, desire to help our constituents. And sometimes you really need the board to do exactly what you're doing at ETM, which is to say, okay, um, let me tell you from the outside what the outside needs to understand. So I think that's such an important um, uh, function and asset that the board brings in is speaking to the staff and saying, listen, we're not trying, trying to tell you how to do your job, but we're trying to tell you, here's what the outside wants to hear, to care about this organization. So how do we get, how do we merge what you and the inside can do with, with what I know as a board member, the outside wants to hear. So I really, I really love that you laid that out and I love that ETM does that so well. Um, this panel is, of, the, of my three panels, this is my finance panel where I have such finance superpower on this panel. Um, many of you have been treasurers, many of you work in the financial services sector. So I'd love to ask each of you who want to answer um, the question that we got a lot from people today and people leading up to the summit. Uh, what does a, what is a board member's um, uh, minimum role if, if they want to be a good board member in terms of um, watching the finances? What is the, the very minimum they need to be doing to be a, just an even decent board member with respect to finances? Because so many feel like they don't even meet that minimal bar. And then of course, I'd love for you to answer what a really great board member looks like who's not sitting necessarily on the finance committee but just a general board member, what, what does a great board member look like in terms of financial oversight? Um, and Ali, since you're on the big screen right now, <laughs> we'll start with you and then we'll go to Sandy and work around. Sure, so um, look, I think as a board member, when it comes to finances, like we, you know, first of all, I try to stay away because I do this for a living. Um, I try <laughs> to stay away from uh, the the uh, the budgeting and the um, and the financial side of it, uh, and focus more on the strategic and governance side. Um, but but I think as a board member, when you get your package, it's really important to just understand the trends. You don't have to be an expert in finance, but you be, you should be able to look at what's happening in the top line, what's happening in the expenses, and be able to ask the right questions. Again, you don't have to know accounting or or um, you know, be able to dissect the financials, but I think that's that's the that's the basic, and and that's what we expect of of our board. Um, the second part of your question was around uh, what makes a good board member. Is that is that right? Um, uh, what would just if you are a board member, what is your responsibility in terms of reviewing the financials, understanding the financials? And, um, you know, in a situation where, heaven forbid, the organization goes under on your watch, what was it that you were supposed to be, have been paying attention to? Yeah, so it, it, just to, to kind of reiterate, and I heard some of the comments in the first panel, and, um, you know, I, I do think having re reviewed the package, understanding the trends, asking questions, listening into the pre presentation um, from, you know, the, the finance committee and the finance directors is really important. Um, but again, you don't necessarily have to be an expert, but my, my view on, on finances is you see something there. Okay, unfortunately you cut out again. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to you. Sandy, um, you've been a treasurer, you work in the finance space. What would you add in terms of um, a board member's fiscal responsibilities? I will note that um, in my nonprofit roles, I've often worked with um, artists, museum curators, uh, people who don't necessarily spend much time thinking about um, the financial function. Um, though I will say some of my best collaborators have been people who um, you know, acknowledge that they, this is not their day job, um, but, but they recognize that the funds are limited um, and that they're asking questions about, okay, this is where we spent our money. Is that, 
is that the priority for our mission? Um, I, I think showing up, showing up, being prepared, at least understanding top level finances, how much do we have um, is, is important. I find some of the questions um, where I often push back as treasurer, where I push back as finance lead on boards is um, when, when people have a desire to spend out of compassion or out of you know, a desire to further the mission, um, but don't want to have the, the, the conversations around um, how much is too much spending right now? How do we think about sustainability? I think a great board member, whether or not you are in the weeds on finance, is having being open to have those discussions around um, uh, intergenerational equity, um, around spending now and what that means for the future, um, and making making those decisions as a group and sticking with them. Um, I'm often trying to get people to stick with, with community decisions. I don't know if you heard in the previous panel, they talked a little bit about the issue of um, eating into the endowment during COVID-19. Um, the endowment is there for a rainy day. Many on the previous panel felt like, if this isn't a rainy day, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, has, has that been a discussion uh, for any of the boards that you've been sitting on? Um, for all of them. And so you know, I, all of them, and I'm sure everyone has similar experiences where it's, um, it's a rainy day. It's a rainy day, but, um, and it's a rainy day. And there's a question of what can we do now? Um, and for me, it's also a question of, okay, if we spent everything would that resolve the issue. Um, and is that at the detriment of what we could be doing in the future? Will someone else be doing what we would have done 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Um, uh, for me, it's been about finding as much cash as possible and pushing it out. Uh, a good number of my um, projects have put out emergency funds. Um, and, then, and then there's the question of um, how, are we, how are we being really thoughtful with the investment portfolio during this time? And can we, can we scrape something away from that for this year, for next year? Um, in one case, one organization that I work with is already spending well above the 5% consciously. Um, and, you know, w w when the question comes up of should we be doing more, um, I think the answer to that is really tied into um, how long do you wish to run this? Like, what is priority right now? And there's no right or wrong answer. And if you stop funding things that you've been spending years building, because you don't want to read it into the endowment, it could be very expensive to have to rebuild that program then. Um, I mean, there, there's that cost as well. Luca, I'd love to hear from you as somebody who works in finance and is, has been a treasurer, and I, I think you're a current treasurer as well. Um, uh, you know, in terms of responsibilities, if you're not somebody who works in finance and you want to be a good board member, um, Ali's told us you should be looking at the trends. Sandy's said that you should be looking at the priorities and whether they seem in sync with your understanding of the organization. What are, what are other things that non-finance board members should be doing around finance? I think this is a great question. And I think, you know, it's, I, I can only imagine if you didn't have a finance background, you get these packets with a bunch of Excel spreadsheets and, you know, the form 99 and you're just kind of overwhelmed by it. Um, and so I'll give one piece of advice from my perspective. I think of it as the canary in the coal mine. Always watch the cash flow. If you don't look at anything else, look at the cash flow statement. There's a lot of accruals on the income statements and otherwise that can be really confusing if you're not versed in what they are and how they were prepared. But I would say if, if the cash flow is going in the wrong direction, if the cash flow is going negative, if there's a you know credit facility and you find yourself you know permanently in the credit facility and the amount of the credit facility increasing, um, those are really harbingers of issues and challenges. Um, and and I think it's important to take action to your point sooner than later. So my advice for maybe somebody who's not as kind of you know financially sophisticated, watch the cash flow. No, I I think that's such great advice. Um, my husband and I each sat on a board, it was the same board where the, the cash flow got was getting lower and lower and then they ran out of the ability to borrow anymore. And so they started making off the books um, uh, loans from board mm -hmm. members. And 
um, they somehow didn't think that that was impacting anything because <laughs> um, even though the bylaws had a limit on how much you could borrow, these, these didn't count as real loans because they were, you know, they weren't in writing and they were just from board members. And so um, watching the cash flow, that, that's so important. And I would be remiss if I did not bring Debbie into this conversation as somebody who's one of our finance superstars on the, this panel. Well, I always ask about who are the people involved when I interview um, the executive director or the president of the board to find out what is their confidence in and familiarity with the CFO. How is that person chosen? And then also with the auditor, because I find that as a finance person, I always um, ask those questions. I'm usually on the audit committee, so I do tend to be more intimately involved with the details, but I think ensuring that there is um, an executive director or a president or whomever the head of the organization is that understands and appreciates the importance of a strong financial person in there, whether it's an accountant or a CFO, um, if it's a board member, whatever that person is, they have an understanding of controls because I actually was involved in an organization. In fact, um, along my you know many year journey, um, one where the executive director was actually um, not a good steward. I mean, to put it mildly, and and actually had been seen to um, siphoning off some of the funds, and then the head of the board did not know it because there were not the appropriate controls in place. So I think just asking those questions, and then if you are a member of an audit committee, ensuring that there um, are two signatures over a certain amount, and actually with one smaller board I'm on, I get a copy of the bank statements with a written description every month. So I think there are a variety of ways to do it, but just ensuring that they have, that you ask about, do they have the right people and have the controls been put in place even as a non-financial board member, you should ask about that when you join the board because it's just so critical. Um, thank you so much. And Deb, Johnny, we can't see you, but I think you are with us. Um, I, I did, I did, I did manage to. Can you hear me? My video is not working, but can you well, hear me? We can hear you and you're, you're particularly well suited to chime in on this one. Um, Yes, so um, I am on the finance committee of Read Alliance as well, and I actually, I, uh, in my day job, I do work with a lot of other not-for-profits in managing investments, uh, endowments, and foundations assets. Um, so I see it from many different sides, um, but I can tell you as a board member, um, it's really important to um, understand, I think Luke mentioned the cash flow, but, but obviously given my background, we get into very detailed discussions and not-for-profits finance statements and financial statements are quite different from the typical companies that we analyze in our uh, work. But um, so it's, it's really putting a little bit of a different understanding of those statements, but, and some of it, um, I think is helpful if you have a good finance person on the staff who can explain to board members why they are, as simple things as why they categorize certain items under different headings and why are they looking at recognizing revenue in certain periods when it's going to come later. Explaining all that to the board to really understand is this, um, are these people you know, doing it in the right way, are we all reviewing it with the correct, asking the right questions as we do this uh, and review the material with the staff and the executive director. So I think there's a lot of pieces to it in terms of it, but, I, but it really does help, particularly what has helped in the recent past during this crisis has been for the finance committee to understand, okay, where are we relative to where we should have been? And a lot of issues that, a lot of flows that we were expecting are not going to be in and we need more upfront capital. How do we manage all that? 
So um, I think it does require really understanding all the different pieces and asking a lot of questions, as many questions as you need to, to really get under the hood of the uh, statement. Um, that is so helpful. Now, a question that just came in for Luke. Um, so once you've noticed that there is a cash flow issue, what are you, they said, what specific action should be taken? <laughs> Other than well, to say, hey, I noticed that this is an issue, what are you going to do about it? Well, I was going to say, I think at that point, particularly if you're on, on the not as financially sophisticated side of the equation, start asking questions. And, and I think you've heard that loud and clear from the panel. You've got, presumably, most boards have a finance committee and an audit committee these days. I think that's now considered best practice to separate them in many cases. Uh, I would avail yourself of talking to the treasurer, talk to the head of the finance committee, spend time with the head of the audit committee, spend time with the CFO and the record keepers at the organization. Um, really seek to understand, is this a harbinger of a problem? Is this a short-term transitory effect and why? Um, I think it's really incumbent on you then, if you see that problem, uh, to start asking questions. And I would start with the folks who are sort of supposed to be the stewards of, of the financial wellness of the organization and are presumably sophisticated on this who can answer it, or if they can't, keep asking questions. <laughs> um, a, a topic that um, I know everybody wanted to discuss, we've had a lot of questions about it, um, are the fundraising responsibility of board members. Um, the concept that um, board members, at least in New York, it's always surprised when I'm dealing with someone who's just moved here from like overseas, that board members in the United States um, supply time, talent, and treasure. Um, overseas, it's mainly time and talent, so that's always a surprise. So um, on the boards on which you sit, um, uh, are they boards where there is a clear expectation of what you're required to give, both in terms of your give as well as your get from friends? Is it a clear number or does it fall into that category of it should be personally significant or, uh, or this charity should be one of your top three priorities? And um, what tools, if any, does your organization give you to help you be successful at fundraising? Um, so in the, I'm looking at the order of my screen of if I, I could start with Jeannie on that perhaps. Sure, um, I would say that, so we, we actually have a very specific minimum to be uh, of give get on the national board. Um, and I will tell you that it's actually been a journey. It, our, our organization did not have a history of, of that. And it's actually been a journey to make sure that we have 100% giving on, on the board, uh, we have a federated model, so so this is really the national board, and the and the focus has really been on a combination of right personally giving a meaningful amount, and that there is a number um, minimum, but then it is very much around um, I would say what are your talents and what are your talents that lead you to get others treasures because everyone has a different skill set. So with a 30 person board, we have a set of people who are actually great at fund development. They are very well networked and they can help us get entrees into uh, whether it's corporate donors or, or private donors. Um, but there, there's also a set of folks who are perhaps not networked in that way, but what they can do is they can get, um, you know, pro bono services for specific things that the organization needs. And so it's very much around figuring out perhaps more on the get side, what it is that e each board member can do to really meet their obligations. But we are pretty um, strict around that because we have to lead by example. If we're going to build that muscle of fund development and you know this kind of view of fiduciary duty, we need to build that. And so we, all of us actually have to meet those, those objectives. Debbie, um, as somebody who sits on boards where I have not placed you, so I don't know how it works on your boards, whereas I do know how it works with Luke and Ollie, uh, for example, uh, are, are the boards you sit on ones with specific give get requirements or is it more amorphous? And have you seen that change over time? Are you asking Deb or Debbie? Or I'm sorry, maybe that's we can a very both. good question. I, I'm, asking, I'm asking you, Debbie. <laughs> okay, that's fine. And I'm sure <laughs> Deb Johnny will also want to chime in. Every arts-related organization whose board I have 
ever served on or currently serve on has a very specific guide as a minimum. And I think that's a good idea. It's the understanding that when you join the board, this is what you're expected to give. So there's really no question. And I do think that's a good idea because that's one of the purposes of a board is indeed uh, fundraising. With the, with the educational boards, it's a little bit different. Um, there is the understanding to give a certain amount, but you're expected to give much more. And the understanding is that this is supposed to be one of the major, if not the major philanthropic effort that you have while you're on that board. And I was on, um, I guess, many Harvard boards, the Alumni Association. I'm currently on the Harvard Business School Club of New York board. I was on the visiting committee, which is the uh, the, gov the governing body of Harvard to visit, actually in this case, it was the business school where I went. Um, and so it's less specific there, but the implication is large and important. So I think that would be it. Um, and then again, on educational boards that I sit on, there is a lot of sort of comparators provided. Well, we have X number of people who gave a million dollars and so-and-so who gave 500. So the message is clearly there. This has to be one of your top priorities. So I would say um, the answer is yes, specifically, and then yes, generally. But I, do, I do think in the 20 years since I started Board Assist, um, there has been this trend, and I'm curious if you all have seen the same trend, of to make it more and more specific. I think, um, 20 years ago it was seen, seen in poor taste to like put a number out there, it just wasn't done. And then I think there was also a fear that if you put a number out there, that people would see it as a ceiling versus a floor. And I think that both of those things have changed. I'm, I'm curious, you know, it, Debbie's shaking her head, yes. It yes, I agree. Evolved, there, it, it does not become um, in any way a ceiling, it is just a floor, but people are so much more comfortable committing and you can attract more um, talented professionals if you are very, very clear about what expectations are. Would, would you agree with that? Can I say something, Cynthia? Please. Um, I think, so yes, we do have, even at Reed, we do have minimums and I think um, for many of the not-for-profits, it's good to have a minimum for board members. One of the things we are trying to do at Reed, though, we work just for everybody. We work with low-income uh, elementary students in disadvantaged neighborhoods around New York City, and we use teenagers from there to also serve as tutors, so it's a dual-impact program. One of the um, issues we've been actually talking about a lot is how do we also have uh, um, these uh, uh, concerns of our clientele and how, how can we represent the <clears throat> clientele of the not-for-profit in the board? And the clientele from this, from the population we serve is certainly not going to be the kind that you can have a, any kind of minimum amount of give get for them. So, but that shouldn't make them also feel uncomfortable being on the board where every other people may be able to give from a dollar point of view much more. And, and we're trying to figure out a way where we can develop both a little bit more equity and focus of the clientele on the board without having the the con the financial contribution become so important that they feel out of place. So, Judge Johnny, it's very interesting you brought this up. This was on a, one of the questions that we had circulated to the panelists ahead of time. This whole concept is a very, very hot topic in the board world right now of, um, you know, especially in the year 2020 of uh, does, are there different numbers for different people because the need to have certain voices represented is so important. And um, it was very interesting to me, several of today's panelists said, oh, please don't bring that up on my panel. <laughs> That's a something that has become a very hot issue at our particular organization. But since none of these current panelists were ones who said, don't bring that up, we can discuss that. And I see that Kirsten Feldman is still with us. And I know this was something she was very interested in discussing. So Kirsten, if, you, if you're interested in coming back on, 
I know that this is something that um, you feel strongly about, but you, you, you may um, be multitasking doing something else right now. So Jeannie seems to want to chime in on this one. Well, I think it's, it's less about, you know, what's the minimum for a board member, but diversity on the board, which is a very, very big topic for the Girl Scouts, right? So we actually do spend a lot of time constructing the board slate to ensure that we actually have representation that's geographic, that's ethnic, that's just um, age, everything. So, so I actually quite proud that our, our upcoming slate, so we, we actually are, we were voted in by a national convention uh, council. So it's a very strict governance policy, but we, we do have that, um, you know, something like, I wanna say over 40, almost 50% of our board is actually people of ethnic and diversity. Now we have a gender bias in that 88% of our board is female, but um, you know, uh, the men are man enough to be Girl Scouts too. So we do have, have <laughs> men on the board. Um, but I think we spend a lot of time, our national board um, development committee spends a lot of time thinking through that makeup because in order to serve our constituents who are the girls, um, regardless, of their background or race or social economic situation that we actually have to have that kind of representation and it was actually it's been such a hot topic i know and i know that that's been a struggle for for many but i think we've actually been very fortunate in that but it, it's not without you know it's challenges because you do need to be extremely deliberate and it is a very i would say um bless our national board development committee it's a lot of work to find candidates who have the kind of belief in the mission, the willingness to, to put in their time, right? And their talent and treasure and, and make sure that it's representative of the girls we serve or the girls we aspire to serve. Cause we actually do, you know, recognize we have our own challenges as an organization. Mr. So Janie, um, you, you touched on, um, you know, this has been a year where everyone has very much been fo focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion at the staff level and at the board level. And at the board level, um, it is about ethnicity, but it's also about financial diversity. This is a topic that, you know, um, uh, is, a, is a relatively new one in, um, in the nominating space in governance. So a board that may have um, a, a really strong mix of, you know, um, uh, Asian and black and uh, Latino board members, but, everybody's rich and you're serving inner city kids. And so this is a whole new area about diversification that nobody was talking about five years ago is, do we need to have financial diversification? Do we need to have some people who are not partners at city like, or managing directors at city like Ali, um, uh, or you know, managing directors at BCG, you know, somebody who uh, is a consumer that uses this service for, is a parent um, of an inner city kid that they're serving. And so that's like a whole other level of diversification that's being talked about for the first time. And then would obviously impact this whole give get conversation. Um, so because we're starting to run low on time, I'd love to ask you each one last question just uh, so we, we end on a really great note. Um, starting with Luke, uh, can you tell us, and you don't have to tell us which board or wherever it was, but just one really great impactful thing that you saw a board member do in 2020 on one of the boards on which you sit. Absolutely. And, and I think you know, this is great because even though to everyone's point, I think we've probably pushed that um, rainy day analogy too far and God knows it's been raining. Um, I think there have been legion examples of people really going above and beyond um, and making, you know, real commitments to organizations, to causes. And frankly, you know, at the end of the day, I think that's why we're all here at some level. It's because we're, we're part of organizations, we're passionate about the mission, um, and we want to find ways to, you know, really get involved and advance that mission. And, and I think it's now more critical than ever. Um, so I can think of, of a whole lot, um, but I would say, I think, you know, I saw some board members really doing things, I would say, out of the ordinary course of what 
you would think of a board in terms of this sort of both time and treasure calculus that, that you've talked about, um, you know, really investing, really engaging, really, you know, letting the organization use them in whatever ways the organization thought was most productive. Um, and and it, it just underscored to me how passionate they were about the mission um, and how much they wanted to advance and protect and preserve the organization. That is so great. And you know what I was saying very early on for those who came in later, um, you know, at Board Assist, we've been so privileged to see New Yorkers at their best all year and just see people doing extraordinary things. And um, it really, you know, we talked in an earlier panel about some good things that have come out of COVID. One of the good things we said in an earlier panel is uh, boards are working so much more closely in 2020 than they were in 2019 or 2018. I mean, there's all these emergency meetings and people really coming together. So, um, Luke, it's so great to hear that you've seen that. Um, Jeannie, have you seen anything extraordinary like somebody renegotiating a lease? So now they're paying 50% less since they have 50% less money coming in. Like the more specific you can be on like extraordinary things you've seen, it could even be something you did. You don't even have to say it was you who did it. <laughs> well, I think part of the big thing actually has been to bring optimism, right? Because I, I think our staff, it, they're really beat up by all the different things that are happening. And so what I found is when board members really share in a, Authentic, authentic way, their optimism for the future, and really thinking about it as, you know, for us, it was, it's been very much around, this is actually an opportunity for us to transform our organization. I mean, the fact that we moved to digital delivery, when, and thinking about hybrid delivery, which is actually where our girls are anyway, it was a big impetus for us. And so to, to kind of put it into, frame it more into, yes, this is a difficult situation we, we acknowledge that but it's also an opportunity for us and it maybe pushes our comfort zone to try these new things that we had thought we would get to right at some point we're there now and i've actually found our board members to be quite inspiring and to give that kind of energy to our staff to keep going right to really believe in the mission um and i think that that's actually been really inspiring and i think it's every single board member that that i've i've worked with has been that way, which I think is important because you could kind of go the other direction, which doesn't really help in this situation. That, that's that's such an uplifting, nice message. So Debbie, it's gonna be hard to um, uh, top that, but Debbie Farrington, <laughs> what, what would you say you've seen? Well, I would use the example of the Harvard Business School Club of New York. You think of Harvard as being an elitist organization. Many people do. But the Harvard Business School Club of New York is extremely community oriented. And there are two extraordinary impactful things that I saw being done. Um, the chairman of the club is an African-American fellow and he is the deputy commissioner of the MBA. He's actually half Asian, half African-American. He led the most extraordinary conversation on race that I've ever been a part of among the board and really trying to share experiences and understanding. We have a very diverse board, men, women, racial, ethnic, et cetera, which is, we're very proud of. And we're very community oriented, as I said. So having this incredibly honest conversation and then going a step farther and saying, what can we do about this? So what we did is we began a community outreach program. And again, it was sort of, you know, what, is, what are Harvard Business School people good at? Finance. Okay. So what we did is we um, instituted a program, and I was part of the developing the scenario planning at a broad level, of outreach to both the Harlem community and the Chinatown community. So we really mobilized things and have outreach where we provide skill sets, one-on-one -on -one, um, one -on -one counseling, counseling for large groups in terms of, of sharing how do, you, how do you manage your cash? How do you, how do you plan for whether you're gonna open or not? So this tremendous outreach, but it started with the self-examination of ourself as a board. So that to me was extraordinarily impactful very moving and really made you sit down and say, okay, what do we do about this? So that to me was an extraordinary example of something that I was involved in that I saw an extraordinary leader spearhead. That, that's, that's a fabulous example. Um, 
So Sandy, the bar is just getting higher and higher. How are you going to top that? <laughs> Um, with the story of the Van Allen Institute, which is a 126 year old design nonprofit that's been based in New York this entire time. Um, it's, and this is a story of board and staff. Um, I, the staff came up with this really wonderful rapid response program um, focusing on um, neighborhoods, partnering with uh, business improvement districts in, in various Brooklyn, Queens, Bronx neighborhoods and understanding what people needed at the community level. Um, and then actually um, the board did two things, which was one, bless the spending of new funds for this, which as you all know, is hard to do in this generally and in this kind of year. Um, and then the board actually, as uh, lots of architects, developers, um, they reached very deeply into their networks and they pulled together their competitors, their peers to put together um, signage um, to connect with the city to figure help people to figure out what they could actually do or not do with um, outdoor seating and how to reopen. Um, but it's been this really wonderful collaboration uh, watching sort of board members think creatively about who are in my networks, what can we do? They've done things like have Freed Frank, the law firm, put together a pop-up sublease template, um, things oh, that wow. are really usable and repeatable. That's, a, that's amazing. All right, Deb, Johnny, you don't have to top that because the bar is getting higher and higher, but we would love to hear from you um, at least one example of something extraordinary you've seen a board member do this year. So I think, um, sure, the, I think what we saw was everybody bring their best self to the board and the organization this year in every possible way. And you really saw people roll up, board members roll up their sleeves. At Reed, we had people who could think, could understand finance, really help the finance team and the, on the PPE. We had to deal with very low income communities going, transitioning to um, remote learning. How do we handle that from even the fact that a lot of the kids don't have access to remote learning devices to then also the most one of the more important things our gala how do we uh, figure that out from being an in person to a virtual and, and and in every different area different board members jumped in and tried to cover the base so that the organization was uh, kept running kept meeting the needs of our client base. And that really was the most important thing that I saw was that the client base dominated our, our population that we serve, dominated everything that was done by the board to make sure that there was no break in the continuity of the service. That, that's, that's so great to hear. And it's, it's such a nice note to end on tonight. Um, we had three goals with our summit today. Um, the first was, as always, with Bordesis, because our role is to find fabulous people like Luke and Deb Johnny and Ollie for nonprofit boards, for this to get people excited about board service. And um, I don't think anybody who's been part of this summit um, who is not already serving on a board could possibly not want to call Bordesis tomorrow at info at bordesis.org and um, ask to be placed on a board because you've made board service um, really sound as impactful and um, fulfilling as it is. Um, a lot of times people think it's just about writing a check. It's so much more than that. You've made it come to life and you've made people understand how in this moment, especially, but at all times, it can be so fulfilling. So that was our first goal and thank you so much for that. Our second goal was to help all the people who are already serving on boards um, be better board members. Um, We've always wanted to have this dialogue of sharing best practices among board members across the city. And I think that you guys have all had in all three panels such fabulous ideas for our attendees about um, great ways that you can be a better and better board member. So we're so grateful for that. And a third thing I'll just end with is, of course, we are a nonprofit ourselves. Um, this is meant to be a fundraiser for board assist to the extent 
that is possible. Many of you received very heavily discounted tickets to the summit today. So if you enjoyed the summit and you would like to make a donation to Board Assist, uh, we're very happy to help you with that. Just go to boardassist.org and from the top of every page of our website, there's a donate, donate button. Um, so um, please don't be shy about using that if, if you've enjoyed our amazing panelists. I want to thank our panelists again for giving me all this time and giving Board Assist and you all this time. I know how incredibly busy they are. Hearing them talk today, you can see um, how much wisdom and insight they have to share. And so I, I'm so grateful to all of them for sharing their time today. And, um, you know, I just can't thank you all enough. I, I, I personally am just so moved by the stories that I've heard today about what each and every one of them is doing with their boards. And I, on behalf of the nonprofit community, I, I thank all of them for their role this year and every year with their board service. So thank you so much and good night to everybody. Um, thank you for being with us and, and stay well. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.